Hello and welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan R. Lack and Sean R. Chapman. That's true. We do have the same middle initial. We do. Uh, yeah. It Which is, I always... we, but we don't have the same middle name, but we have the same middle second initial. The second letter, letter in our middle names is the same. Past that, that's not the case, though. No. This, Fun this... facts for the podcast. I think this is a good start. <laughs> All right. So this is the Weekly Stuff Podcast. Yeah. If you missed last week, hadn't heard, we were WGTC Radio. We were. We are the Weekly Stuff Podcast now. We are. Otherwise, it's the same. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Go to go to www.jonathanlack.com for podcasting stuff now instead of we got this covered. But other than that, we're going to yeah. keep going. Last week we talked about 2014 year in preview. Yep. All the stuff we're excited for this year and uh this week surprisingly is a pretty busy week. Yeah. Yeah, in, lots of stuff happened. In some ways because horrible things happened and it's sad. Yeah. Uh, and in some ways because there was just some news to talk about, some things we still need to catch up on that there just wasn't time for last week. Um, so we've got a lot of news, a lot of things to go through. At the end of the podcast, like our main topic today will be, we're going to talk about the third series of BBC's Sherlock, yeah. which just finished airing last week on PBS. So now it's aired in the UK, aired in America, we can talk about it without fear of legal repercussions. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, the NSA were definitely going to send people after us so they realized we p- potentially could have pirated it. Let's say that we would have, because that's madness. Who would, you know, who would ever do that? Right. That's that's PBS's logic because apparently <laughs> they they're not they're bound to determine not to air shows day and date with the UK. Yeah, it is. Yeah, like well, Downton Abbey still airs on like a six month delay, and that's the yeah, most well, popular series. Who wants to watch that? I don't know. I my mother and her uh, aunt, who's like seventy something. So, well, yeah, yeah that's Downton the Abbey. <laughs> All right, we're um, announcing our new Downton Abbey podcast. It's, <laughs> I'm really excited about it. It's going to be airing uh, every Sunday, I believe. So. WGTC Abbey, exactly. All right, anyway, no. Uh, some stuff before we get started here. Um, there is a new podcast archive page on www.jonathanlack.com, and you should definitely look at this if you're a fan of the podcast. Uh, it took me a while to put together, and several failed tries because Blogger sucks. They never start a blog with Blogger. I'm kind of stuck with it yeah. for now, but uh, yeah, it's not a good back end, but... It, you go to the, the when website. you stop using Blogger, we can start another new podcast. Think of how like we'll have to come up with another new name. No, I'm excited. I, I would just port the current site over, and I'm in the process of trying to figure out how to do that. But I don't know. I think when when we decide that it's time to have our fifth podcast, okay, that's well, that'll be the transition. Anyway, this has every episode of WGTC Radio slash Weekly Stuff Podcast. If you go to the website on the top, you'll see a you know row of buttons: home, about, contact, that sort of thing. You know, it's a website. Yeah, one of the things is podcast. You go there, and it has the you know subscribe to it on iTunes. It's got the latest episode, whatever that is, and you can stream it in the window. It's got some info on that, and then below that is the archive, and it goes episode by episode. You've got date, description, and an MP3 link, and you can stream that MP3 in your browser, or you can just download it. But it's got everything all the way back to number one. And I think this is cool in part because iTunes, uh, for our podcast, only goes back 25 episodes. Huh. And I'm not sure why it does that. Um, I think it's because... iTunes is racist against yeah. Irish people, because I'm on the podcast. So. Right. They, the people who run iTunes came from, like, early 20th century America. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So anyway... Fucking assholes. But... Yeah, so everything's here. You can doubt they're all here. Uh, it's a it's a really good looking page, I think, and it's it's got everything. So this was a bitch to put together, a lot of cut and pasting and yeah, editing I can and stuff. So, yeah. But uh, you know, it gave me a chance to listen to a lot of Persona music and some other stuff. So, and you know, I'm glad we have it. And every week it'll be updated with you know things in the going in the archive and going to the latest podcast tab and everything. So that'll be good. Um, other cross promotional stuff. My book, which was released last year, you may have heard about it on the podcast. It's called Fade to Lack: A Critic's Journey Through the World of Modern Film. It's got a lot of reviews, a lot of writing about movies, analysis, that sort of thing. Uh, just reissued that with a slight change. The cover, instead of being gloss, is now matte. Oh, sexy! It's, it's actually much nicer. So that was that was nice. It was out of uh, off Amazon for a couple days while we were making that change. It's back up. So uh, go to fadetolack.com, go to jonathanlack.com, there are purchase links everywhere, and you can also get it on Kindle, but then you don't get a Mac cover. Yeah, that's true. So, And there is a promotion on Amazon, if you buy the physical book, you do get the Kindle book for free. Oh, nice. So, And the Kindle book is DRM free, you can do whatever the fuck you want with it. Yeah. I would ask you not to pirate it, but, but you know. I mean, <laughs> you said you can do whatever the fuck yes, you want with it. you can. That, you know. Yeah, That's this the, isn't Sherlock. Like, it's your book, you know. Right, exactly. You can pirate books. It's fine. Nobody cares. 
So other than that, Sean, uh, before we yeah. get into you know news and stuff, what's what stuff is going on with you? Anything to talk about? No, that's, I've, I've done nothing interesting. Unless we want to, you know, talk about how women are used in James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. I can have a long discussion about that because I'm writing an essay right now. But other than that, no. What is the thesis statement of your essay? <sighs> that's like fucking. If I did that before. Let's not get into this. Okay. This is a long discussion. It's a long essay so far. All right, sounds good. Uh, I've I've. Sampled a couple of games in the last week. I 100%ed Tomb Raider. That was fun. That's well the first done. I saw you playing that on, on PS4. Yes, I played a lot of Tomb Raider, and it was good. Um, I basically got every single player trophy, and I went into multiplayer and dabbled in it to see if I should get the multiplayer trophies, and I could not get a single match where the opponents would show up across <laughs> multiple play sessions, so I've given up on that. It will just be at, like, 70% trophy completion. Yeah, it's another proof that... You should never have multiplayer achievements or trophies unless your game is multiplayer only. Like yeah, if it has I, a single player component that's significant, all the achievement slash trophies should be in the single player, God damn it. I, I, I completely agree that would be much nicer. And you could also flesh out the single player experience that way too. Exactly. Yeah, you could give more things to do through the achievements. But Tomb Raider's still good. Uh, but the big release on PS4 this week, because it's the PS Plus game for the month, yeah. is Outlast, which is this survival horror game. Yeah. Um, I played about an hour of it this morning. I can't give full judgment on it, but I'll say it's the kind of game where I sat down just intending to sample it. I had other stuff to do, and I wound up playing it for an hour, and I'm very eager to get back to it. So, so far, that's as much of a thumbs up as you could give a game after yeah. playing it for Did just a little bit of time. Did you get killed by any half-naked psych ward patients with like scars on their faces yet? Yes. Okay, good. Three times. Uh, <laughs> but no, Outlast is good. It's a, it's a very effectively creepy game. It's got some jump scares that... They work, and definitely, I again, I've got this new surround system. It just freaks me out, playing nice. Outlast. But uh, no, it's, it's, it's fun so far. It's got really nice graphics. It's got that kind of grain effect like the original Mass Effect had, only it's yeah. much nicer because we're on PS4 hardware. They can make it a little more seamless. Well, it is. like, And I actually I downloaded it, but I haven't really played it, but I've seen some of Outlast because I, th- I think it is an interesting game because it's sort of... The premise is like... It's kind of like a found footage game in a way because it's like you're... This dude who infiltrates an insane asylum and has like a, everything's through his camcorder. Not or at everything. least you can you, can, yeah. you can take it down. But why the fuck would you? Like everything, you should have like basically the camcorder up always, if, unless you want to take off the cool filter. Um, kind of yes and no because there are some components with that. With like you have to have batteries for the camcorder and stuff. But yeah, we definitely whenever you have to look in the dark, you use night vision yeah, through you have the to camera, use night vision. Yeah. and that's. It's cre- I mean, it, it works. It's very creepy so far. It's got, I think, a mild satiric comedic side that I'm kind of waiting to see where that goes. There's just a little bit of that so far. Hmm. But otherwise, you know, it's, it's a fairly stock story so far. You go to this insane yeah. asylum, something shitty has happened there. I'm not sure what. I haven't gotten to a lot of narrative material yet. Hmm. But man, just as a visceral gameplay experience, it's really good, and I think it proves that horror can work really well in a video game. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, you know, it's... It's, it's sometimes more effectively because that interactive component really gets you on edge. Yeah, I mean, with me, like, I actually don't like horror games that much. Like, I don't play a lot of them, but I find, as opposed to horror movies, I find horror games extremely stressful instead it of just is, scary. It is a stressful game, It's yeah. just, like, everything, like, all the music and the atmosphere and, like, how easily you can be killed, all of that's just designed to just, like, make you just fucking so stressed out. And unlike with a movie... Like, you, there's a component of that, but you're just watching the movie. So there's, like, yeah. no sort of, like, in a game, if you're, if you're feeling, like, really freaked out or stressed out, it's like you're the one who has to, like, physically keep on doing it. So it feels kind of masochistic at some point. It is. more games to me. It is, and I would recommend without last. This is not the kind of short game where you should just yeah, sit down and, short. and play the whole thing. Because it's, like... Definitely after an hour, I had to stop because the stress yeah. was just like, I gotta go do something yeah. else. Yeah, horror games are like, it's a really interesting experience. Like, if, if you have if you play video games that haven't tried a horror game before, like, Outlast seems like it's a kind of horror game that is straight up horror. It's not like... It is very straight fear, up. Fear, which fear was like half combat, half horror. Yeah. Like, this is just like, there you, are don't no, have, you don't have weapons, there's no combat no. system, everything's about running away and hiding if you get caught. So it's yeah. basically, mechanically, a stealth game. But like atmospherically all horror. Yes. So yeah. And it's got some interesting control things, so we'll see. I again there's some things so far that could potentially annoy me mechanically, but you know, I have to play the full game before I talk about that more. 
Uh, the other game I tried out this week because they had a sale on all the Persona games on PSN. Yes. So again, for like you, the third time in a while. Yeah, if you own a PS3 or a PS Vita and have not played Persona 3 or Persona 4 or one or two, those you know, but yeah. you, they're all on sale and they're super cheap and go buy them. Persona 3 especially because it's like nine ninety nine. You can play it on PS3. It's fast. It's got everything. Yeah, it's the yeah, greatest it's the game good, ever made. It's a good version of the game. Yeah. yeah. So As you're good. To that soulless abomination that you. Well, you can get Persona 3 Portable too, but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, get, get fast. But anyway, uh, I started playing Persona 2 on my Innocent Vita. Sin? I Innocent Sin? Innocent Sin. Yeah, because yeah, there's, there's two parts to it. They were both on sale. Innocent Sin is nine ninety nine. Eternal Punishment is four ninety nine. I watched the opening movie to Eternal Punishment, which is I so great. Yeah. But Innocent Sin so far, it's interesting. You think I've, Pers- I've played a bit of it. I've played probably okay. like five hours of it, and I mean to go back. It's been a couple of weeks since I played it last time. It's, it's like I just kind of dropped off. It definitely hasn't hooked me, but, I mean, here's what I would say. If you think Persona 4 is slow to get started... Yeah, yeah, play Persona, Persona 2 does take a bit, like... I still haven't gotten to a battle yet, so... Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, there's that element to it. And there's like... But once you get a couple of hours in, once you meet Maya and Yukino, like once those two characters come to the story it starts picking up a lot more because then there's like a lot more sort of, I don't know, group drama and like a Persona 4 kind of way that's going on. Okay. Yeah, we'll Persona say, 2 and it's insane. Like, it's, it's a, you know, there was a game re- originally made in the, I think like 98 or 99. Yeah. And so like, you know, it's that kind of JRPG so you have to be ready for it in that kind of pacing and that kind of combat. It's old in that sense. But once you kind of get into it and you sort of give, give yourself to it, there's a lot there's a lot to enjoy there, I think. And the music right off the bat is yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, so. yeah cuz the this version is the PSP remake which has the sort of remixed three done soundtrack that's it's, really It's also really got good. the original which is good too. Yeah, if you want to switch. But like, you, but you know what's too bad? What? You go into the Velvet Room, it just plays the Persona 3 Aria of the Soul. Yeah, it does, and if yeah. you switch to the Persona 2 one, not only is I think it it's a really good version that I'd rather hear in this context. It fits the visuals because there's actually in that Velvet Room a guy playing the piano yeah. and a girl singing. And they're doing it in time to the music. It's awesome. Yeah. But other than that, all the other, like, because it's mostly just, it's, it's the themes from the original right. game just sort of like with actual instrumentation as opposed to it all being yeah. MIDI. So it's, no. But uh, yeah, Shoji Meguro is awesome. Yes, that is, that is true. We've talked about that before. Yes, we have. And she'll talk about it again. Probably, Because yes. there are so many Persona games coming out this year. <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> all right, so let's move on to, there's, there's no good way to transition yeah. into this. Uh, Sunday, February 2nd, Philip Seymour Hoffman was found dead in his apartment in New York. And that's one of the saddest things I've heard in a really, really long time. Yeah, it really... Sick. God, it fucking sucks, dude. Philip Seymour Hoffman was one of my very favorite actors. Yeah. Is that true for you, too? Yeah, definitely. Like, he's definitely... He's one of those actors that, like, no matter what kind of movie he was in, like, be it, like, a comedy movie or an action movie or a drama movie, what kind of role he was in... Or, like, you know, how small or big the role was, no matter what, every performance he had was fucking awesome. It was. Like, bar I mean, none. And that was the start. You know, I wrote a, a memorial piece for him on my website right after hearing this. And the first thing that came out when I was trying to, you know, write about this was I never saw a Philip Seymour Hoffman performance I didn't love. Yeah. And I mean love. He is so good in everything. And, and that it, it applies to a lot of the, you know, maybe less good movies he did. Not that he did yeah. a lot of bad movies or anything. Like Twister. But, yeah, he's great in Twister. But, like, even some movies that I thought he was in that are mediocre dramas that I don't think were very good, like The Ides of March or A Late Quartet, those are some recent ones he did. I don't like those movies, and he's phenomenal in them. And that's just, that is so true that, you know, you give him sort of bad or underwritten material and he'll hit it out of the park. You give him great material and you get some of the greatest performances yeah. of all time. So, <laughs> I mean, where would where would you go with this? What would you want to say beyond that? Dude, he's just it's just one of those things that I don't know. It's just so it's just so like sad that like you just don't expect yeah to hear that news and to get like, you know, he was an actor so good that it was like when I heard that he was in The Hunger Games Catching Fire, like, I don't go see a lot of movies because I don't have time to, and it's sort of, like, a hassle for me. And But, like, I heard he was in the movie, so I was like, I just watched the trailer just to see him. Like, that was the only reason. I didn't give a shit about anything else. I just wanted to see him in the trailer, you know? Like, that's how compelling and charismatic of an actor he is and how interesting his performances are. You just have to see, like... Two lines, and that's it. Like, you're already sold on the performance. Well, and here's the other, you know, conclusion I came to thinking about him, is that I think 
while he could do you know amazing work in leading roles, and there are some movies where he's the main character and he's terrific, like you know The Master from just two years ago. He is one of the two leads in that movie, and it's amazing. But he really was to me the best supporting actor of this generation, yeah. because you know I think we often undersell or undervalue the worth of supporting performances, mm-hmm. but they are so crucial to making things click. And you ha- you just look at Philip Seymour Hoffman movies like. Almost famous, like Mission Impossible Three, God, those kinds so of roles, fucking... and that's that he centers those movies and he makes them work through this, you know, just by being there on the sidelines and giving this incredibly lived-in work that is just so well detailed and observed and defined, and you really can. And Mission Impossible 3 was my core example of this Because it's not the best movie he ever yeah, starred in without a doubt but, but good God is he a great villain I mean, for, and for <laughs> my money Like, you know, Mission Impossible 3 is not like The greatest action movie ever made Like, it's far from it But Philip Seymour Hoffman's character in that movie Is probably, in my opinion, the best villain of an action movie ever Like, he is It's very possible So, like, of that kind of movie Like, he is so supremely intimidating And that role in, like, the most amazing way possible and I really do think it elevates everything in a way that is very crucial. And this is true of so many of his supporting performances. Everything else that movie does well clicks into place because he does his job so perfectly. Yeah. And he does it without ego, and he does it you know, without trying to oversell what he has. He just plays that part so well. And that intimidation factor you talk about, no one else could play a villain Quite like he did Yeah And it's too bad You know one of the many things That's too bad about him being gone Is that that's really His only major villainous performance That's true yeah And he could have He, he is a villain in, in Catching Fire Too um, And he's, he's really great In Catching Fire It's the same kind of thing Catching Fire works As well as it does In part because Philip Seymour Hoffman Is on the sidelines And we keep cutting back to him Just oozing evil Yeah <laughs> And it's awesome It is so awesome And he's got one scene In that movie With Jennifer Lawrence Where like you wonder how Katniss doesn't run screaming from the room, <laughs> that kind of thing, you yeah. know. <laughs> but yeah, I, and I, you know, Mission Impossible Three is definitely, I think, one of the, the the great or very good modern action movies because of him. Yeah. Like you look at Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, the fourth one, it's a better movie in so many ways. It's got better action. I think it's got better music. I think it's got sort of a better ensemble to it. And yet, it doesn't have that villain at the core that makes everything click, that you want to see Ethan Hawke overcome all these obstacles so he can fucking punch that asshole in the face, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so it's not as good a movie overall. Mm-hmm. But what other performances do you love of Philip Seymour I mean, Hoffman? for me, like, the, I mean, the one when I first really noticed Philip Seymour Hoffman was in The Big Lebowski. Because so that's great. one of my favorite movies. And he has, like, what I was saying, like, no matter, like, what kind of movie it is Like it's a comedy And how small the role Like he has a really minor role In the film Like he's only in a handful of scenes Because he plays The big the Like driver. Jeffrey Lee Lebowski's Yeah Butler Limo driver And he's just in a few scenes But he has Other than John Goodman Who obviously has like The most significant rapport With Jeff Bridges And the dude Like when like that Just the scene When Jeff Bridges The dude first goes To see the big Lebowski And he's leaving And he's just like you know the Philip Seymour Hoffman's character is just talking to him like they have such an instant like instant really interesting rapport between the two of them where you like the Philip Seymour Hoffman character is so sort of naive and just doesn't like have any presumptions about the dude like based on his appearance and his class and stuff he's just like chatting with the dude as if the dude is the dude you know it's right it's, and then that's the best the best like moments it's just like a handful of seconds in that movie it's one of my favorite shots in the whole movie is after the Big Lebowski gets his the uh, the cut off toe, and he, I think he's in the uh, like his parlor, or whatever, at the fireside. Like you know, it's the strong men also cry. That scene, the introduction to that scene is Philip Seymour often opening up the doors to this massive chamber, and the way he just opens the doors like into the camera standing in the middle, sort of steps aside in this super over dramatic way. Like it just sets the tone of that scene immediately, so perfectly to make it one of my favorite scenes in that whole movie. Just. Like if he if if the way he opened those doors was not like that, that scene would not be nearly as funny as it is. It's just the smallest thing. Well, you know, on uh, on Alan Seppenwall and Daniel Feinberg's TV podcast, they were talking about Philip Seymour Hoffman earlier this week, and they made a great point about him in that movie, which is that nothing Philip Seymour Hoffman does in The Big Lebowski could possibly have been in the script. Yeah, like on exactly. the page, yeah. it's just him doing these amazing things with this 
not, you know, intentionally nothing role. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you could have gotten anyone for that part, but the movie is so much richer because Philip Seymour mm-hmm. Hoffman comes in and does these kind of crazy things with it. Yeah, it's, that's definitely true. That there's nothing in the script or the dialogue that sort of gives that character the identity that Philip Seymour Hoffman gives it. That's definitely true. Yeah. I mean, he was the kind of, you know, because I, you know, we're younger, I, you know, I'm 21, you're 21 now. Yes. Yeah. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman was the kind of actor who was around my whole life that I was conscious of movies. Yeah. And especially, of, you know, of new movies. And I just, it feels like him being gone doesn't make sense because he's kind of always been here. Mm-hmm. And I just, he, I just like seeing, you know, knowing he was going to be in a movie would make me go see a movie. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's just, it's so incredibly sad. You know, the other great performances I, I was kind of singling out over the weekend, um... You know, we talked about The Master. I think that film, for me, if you want to see just the totality of the kind of range he had as an actor, a lot of that is in The Master. And he's doing that with a part that I feel is structurally and from a scripting standpoint very imperfect and in many ways underwritten. But it's an amazing performance. Mm-hmm. And you look at him in uh, in Doubt. It's this movie that came out in, I think, 2007 yeah. or 2008. And it's just this, it's based on a play, and it's this very intimate little ensemble piece. It's him and Meryl Streep and Amy Adams and Viola Davis, and they're all great, but he really is the the greatest among equals there. Um, because he's got this part, he's this priest who's been accused of molesting a young boy, uh, and he we think he hasn't. That's kind of the, where we're edging on with the movie, but we never really know. Yeah. And he has some fantastic scenes in that. That's a movie I really haven't seen since it came out, but it's always stuck with me. Um, in large part because of his work. That's the performance yeah. I remember most from that movie. Um, and then another film from around that time period is Charlie Wilson's War. Not a remarkable movie in most ways. Hmm. It's, a, it's a good biopic about um, America arming the Afghani rebels and creating the Taliban. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what it's about. And it's Tom Hanks and, and Julia Roberts and a bunch of other actors. But Philip Seymour Hoffman owns the movie. And it's this performance where he is blisteringly funny as this... CIA agent who's, you know, he's that kind of, kind of stock character who's kind of very loud and prone to monologue making, but he really makes that character his own, and he makes it both screamingly funny and very weighty. And so those are kind of, to me, the, the performances that rattle around in my head as, as being so definitive for him. But there are many I haven't seen, and I feel yeah. kind of bad about. Like, I want to see, now that he's gone, I want to catch up on Capote, which I never saw, yeah. which is what he won his Oscar for. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. Yeah, so. it, it is one of those things that when he, he passed away and I saw that it just like made me realize it's like, I need to go see more of his older films that I just never got around to seeing. Well, and here's the thing. You look through his filmography and he died so young. He was only 46. Yeah. I had no idea he was that young. Yeah. Like, I, I, it's just, I, not that I thought he was old or anything, but you look at 46 and for someone to be dead, that just strikes you yeah, as so tragic. Yeah, it definitely does sort of like, you don't think about it until you see that age. It's like, how could... Like, nobody should die no. at that age, you know? No, and... But, you know, you look at his filmography, and even though he could have had so much more time to make so many more great movies, and there are movies coming out with him in it that are yeah. apparently fantastic, and he's... You know, there's two more Hunger Games movies that you will get to enjoy Philip Seymour Hoffman in, yeah. and that's awesome. Um, and he had a movie at Sundance that people were saying was one of his best performances ever, so, you know, I'm very excited to see these. But even with just, you know, what existed at the time of his death... That is a great filmography for an actor. It's a historic filmography. It's the it's the body kind of body of work that people will be talking about. I think in a hundred years in film history, that people will be rediscovering this actor. Yeah, and he's going to live on through that, and that's great. You mm-hmm. know, um, I just you know I wish he would have had more time, and I feel really bad for his family. He had three young children. That's mm-hmm. terrible. Um, but you know, he was an awesome actor. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, like, obviously, the work lives on. Yes. And so does the beard. I, uh, I looked through some pictures of him, and, you know, not a, he did not have a beard in a lot of movies, but in public he had kind of a short beard a lot of the time, and it looked awesome. Yeah. And I just, you know, I was looking through pictures for the piece I put up on the site. It's like, this, he was a cool-looking dude. Yeah, it was. So anyway, Philip Seymour Hoffman, we will miss you. Yeah, pour one out for you. Yep. Again, no good way to transition out of this. But let's talk about some movies that... Would undoubtedly be better if they had Philip Seymour Hoffman in him. Yeah, like any movie ever made. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much. Uh, but okay, so uh, same same day as uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman passed away was the Super yeah, Bowl. Yeah, Super Bowl day, which was stupid and haha, lol, Broncos. Uh, anyway, Super Bowl day also brought us some new movie trailers. Yes, it did. And we want to talk about some of those because at least 
No. Only two of these we are interested in as movies. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Yes. 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 But there was some good yes. marketing for these movies. So the first one, uh, this was definitely the one that got the most chatter online I saw, like the best response. People were really enthusiastic about the like short ad that aired doing this during the Super Bowl and then the longer two and a half minute trailer. And this is Captain America, the Winter Soldier. This new trailer is it focuses on the Winter Soldier. Yeah. Kinda yeah. like we had gotten vague plot things in the previous teasers. Yeah, we had seen him catch Captain America's shield on the rooftop at yeah. night. But this was much more story heavy. Blow up a van. And I and I like this trailer in contrast to a trailer we're gonna talk about in a minute. Yeah. Because it's story heavy but I don't feel like anything's been spoiled. Yeah, like, I don't have any idea what the actual plot of the movie is. All I know is that there's some dude called the Winter Soldier who's fucking shit up. And who know, who could the Winter Soldier possibly be? <laughs> I have no idea. But, but either way, this trailer is exactly kind of what I want. Because it gives me a sense of the scale and scope of the movie. But I don't feel like there's any surprises that will be ruined once yeah. I get into the theater. I know that at one point Captain America will be on an elevator and he'll beat the shit out of everyone in that elevator. And it looks like a really good scene. Yeah, it does. Uh, what are you thinking? How, how are you thinking this movie looks at this point? I think because because I had not seen this trailer until we just watched it together before we recorded the podcast, and I think it's an awesome trailer. I think the trailer before this one was also awesome. It's got the Falcon in it. You know, uh, Black Widow is in it. Samuel L. Jackson is Nick Fury's in it. They've got the Winter Soldier. I don't know who. I don't know who the Winter Soldier is, but he's in it. It looks awesome. Like, I'm really, you know, especially coming off of Thor 2. Thor 2 was fucking great. I'm, you know, full steam ahead, goddammit. I, I want to see this movie. Hopefully there's a scene where Cap hangs his shield next yeah. to Thor's hammer. Exactly. Uh, no, it, it looks great, and, I mean, all signs point to yes on this one. The trailers have been really good. Marvel seems exceptionally um, confident in this movie. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's cool. Um you know, they've, they've had a good run lately. I think Phase 2 has been really good so far. And, you know, we have an interesting year of Marvel movies ahead of us. Because we've got yeah, this... Yeah, we still have Guardians of the Galaxy. Yep. And even, then, and even this Captain America movie is... It's a big departure from Captain America so far in movies. Because, you know, the first movie was so... Such a period piece. Yeah, it was like a World War II adventure film. And right. this one looks like a sort of spy action movie in a way. Yeah, and going full steam ahead on a big kind of genre change... That's interesting. Yeah. And that's not something you see much in superhero movies, uh, or at all. Yeah. Really. So. so. Um, looks Super good. excited, yeah. Yes. All right, and the other superhero movie trailer was The Amazing Spider-Man 2, which had a full four-minute trailer online. Yeah. And I I really liked it, and yet I, I wish... It was, yeah, I thought it was a good trailer. Yeah. I thought it was. I wish I hadn't watched it, because I felt like it gave away a ton about just sort of the first act of the movie, and, and about Electro. And oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely just, does. We, and I, I, st I will say, though, it alleviated an awful lot of my concerns about the movie because I see much more clearly how they're integrating Electro into the larger world. I see where the other villains might come from with this specific story since Electro is so tied into Oscorp. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it looks good. I Definitely, it feels like they're, they've gotten some of the Spidey banter down better than they Maybe. had in the first movie. Like, it's, it's just the it, we, we just have to see how it's used in yeah. the context in the film. Like, it's such yeah. a hard thing to get from a trailer. Right. But, and hey, Spidey's suit looks really good. Yes, it does. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, as soon as I see that on screen, I almost forget about that abomination they used last time around. So, it's just, it's baffling to me about why they didn't just use, like, it's not like, like the design they came up with this one, some revolutionary Spider-Man suit. It's the fucking Spider-Man suit. I have no idea why they just didn't use it last time. Because they were trying to differentiate themselves in ways they didn't need to. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so fucking stupid. That they did that with that last movie. Yeah. They've, they've learned the error of their ways. But what did you think of the trailer overall? I, I liked it a lot. I think I agree with you. It's one of those trailers that gives a lot away. Although it's it's because it's a thing where it's like I've read so many Spider-Man stories that when you said it gave a lot away, I couldn't actually think of anything in my head that it gave away because it's like I've read so many Spider-Man stories that it's like this one is like it's completely inconsequential to me at some point what the story is because like it's one of a thousand I've read. Right. But I do, I like that, at the very least, it seems like they are changing Electro's origin to not be, he was just working on a Transformer during a lightning storm, then they hit it, and then he has lightning powers. Looks like there's something more substantial going on here. It looks very similar to, uh, in the spectacular Spider-Man TV show, where yeah, he's, yeah. he's in the tank with electric eels. Yeah, exactly. So, so he should just call himself Electric Eel Man at that point. <laughs> or the Moray Eel, I don't know, he should do that, but... Then Spidey could call him Moron Eel. Exactly. There's yeah. So many possibilities. But I think Jamie Foxx looks really good. I like yeah. the idea that he's a big Spider-Man fan mm -hmm. who feels kind of outcast. Yeah. You know. 
The, it, the, although, it is a weird thing because it feels like this trailer, to me, when I was watching it, because, you know, when the, we talked about the last Amazing Spider-Man 2 trailer, you talked about how that trailer seemed like it was a trailer all about a movie where the Green Goblin was going to be the main villain in the movie, and then Electro and Rhino are kind of in it. This trailer seemed like a movie that was all about Electro, and then Harry Osborn is in it with, like, a hint of Green Goblin that probably would... But it seemed like if you watched just this trailer, you'd assume, you would assume Green Goblin would not be in the movie at all. Yeah. And it's like... I, there's been, I don't know how these two trailers are for the same movie. At the end of the day, like, that's just the feeling I have. It's like, I watch these two trailers. It's like, it seems like they had... They shot, like, two... Like, like one movie that was two movies and then cut two different trailers for it that showed different aspects of it. But they're still, like, clearly two movies. It's just some of them had the same scenes, you know? Well, here's what I'll say. It, it feels to me like one hand does not know what the other is doing... Kind of, yeah. ...in the marketing department at, at Sony for this Spider-Man movie because... Every indication the filmmakers have given is that this is electrocentric. The name of the movie in Spanish-speaking countries is The Rise of Electro. I mean, this is like... And that's what they've talked about. Jamie Foxx was on hand at Comic-Con to talk about this. This is what they're focusing on. And that trailer, that that first full trailer that came out that was so Green Goblin-centric surprised a lot of people, including... um, Including us. Including us, including some critics who had, had, you know, talked to people involved in the movie who were very worried about any Green Goblin spoilers getting out at all. Like, from, what, I, from yeah. what I've heard, Mark Webb and Andrew Garfield and some of the other people involved absolutely did not want anyone to know Green Goblin was in this until the movie came out. Like, that is a surprise in the movie. That's what they had indicated to certain reporters. Um, Drew McWeeny at Hit Fix wrote up about this at the time of that trailer's release, that he was really surprised about this. And, and I believe him on that, because it's, yeah. it, that was a surprise, and that the posters were like that. Well, since then, they've shifted away from that. Now we've got this trailer, which feels much more like a, the trailer to this movie should be. It's electrocentric. Yeah. It's got hints of other villains. But we've got our main villain, and the surprises are kind of kept as surprises. Yeah. And I really do wonder if just that there's been some marketing mishaps. Like, they, like people are not communicating yeah. well. It would be almost like if, you know, when Star Trek Into Darkness came out, if the first trailer for that <laughs> was just con. straight up said that he was con, and the second trailer tried to keep it a mystery. Right. It's like that. It's just like... These aren't the same... These are different movies. Like, what do you... Like, either he's con or he's not. It's like either Green Goblin's in the fucking movie or he's not. Like, if you want to keep it a secret, fucking keep it a secret. I mean, you've done a bad job of it already. Yeah. But, you know, don't fucking make your trailer seem like he's the main villain if he's not. So I have no idea. So, yeah, it's weird. I I can totally see a movie where Electra's the main villain and we've got Green Goblin, you know, kind of at the end as this kind of last surprise. And that would be fine, I'm sure, you know, that could be great. But definitely these, def- there have been two different movies suggested by these two trailers. Yeah. And hopefully between... I hope the next one makes it seem like Rhino's the fucking main <laughs> villain of the movie. And then the one after that, because I read this, that uh, BJ Novak is playing Alistair Smythe in the movie too. Yeah. He's another fucking Spider-Man villain. So then the one after the next trailer, like we haven't even seen anything from him, makes it seem like he's the fucking main villain in the movie. And then he actually is when the movie comes out. I do think people were making way too much yeah, of that Alistair Smythe story. Because there are a bunch of people making fun like haha there's four major main villains it's like you have no indication that Alistair Smythe will be main in any way because yeah. BJ Novak yes. no one even knew he's, he was in yeah, the movie he's, a, he's from the fucking office you know it's yeah. not like yeah he's not a like huge marquee no. actor that's like if he's in the movie he must have the biggest part you know right and he wasn't even and really... Alistair Smythe is not a huge villain anyway so, although I would say that about Electro too well so. but they could also be setting it up for future movies you know there's all sorts uh, remember MJ was in this movie at one point that is true <laughs> So who knows? Maybe they were... this movie. <laughs> the production of this movie, from our perspective, not knowing actually anything about it, seems so fucking bizarre. It, it does. I hope there's a like a documentary on the Blu-ray <laughs> that just goes through all this step by step. Yeah. And then you find out that it's like they originally had five different scripts for the movie that had all the different villains as the main villain, and then they just made it into one movie at some point. All right. Last trailer that aired during the Super Bowl. This was only yeah, a which Super- you. You know, maliciously subjected me to before we, against my will, before this podcast. Yes, I changed Sean to a chair and, like, it was like Clockwork Orange. I yeah, forced you, your eyes yeah, open. Yeah, putting eye drops, even though it's like 30 seconds long. Right. My, you know, my eyes dry quickly. Well, I didn't want to hurt you. Yeah. I just wanted to show you a Transformers. And now trailer. I can't commit violent actions anymore. You know, it's just like Clockwork Orange. It's impressive. Yeah, you see enough destruction in a Transformers trailer. You're like, I'm done <laughs> yeah, with that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but they had the trailer for Transformers. I really wish they were writing the title for this movie, Trans 
T R A N S, and then the number four, and then Maris. That would be so yeah. awesome. But they're continuing not doing our it. theme from our last podcast, where we clearly understand how to title things better than the people in charge. Absolutely. Instead, it's Transformers: Age of Extinction. Who gives a fuck? But yeah. anyway, the trailer is Prepare for extinction, Jonathan. The trailer is completely like gibberish, unremarkable, totally generic. Looks like just shots out of other Transformers movies with Mark Wahlberg just photoshopped in there. Right. Basically, doing the Sheila Booth thing of shouting yeah. in action, uh, and then it. No. But, but the last thing in the trailer is is Optimus Prime riding a dinosaur with a sword. And I, this is what I said on Twitter. This will probably be a bad movie, but as far as the Dinobots are concerned, they are going for it. Yeah. So, well, we, we haven't heard Grimlock say "Me, Grimlock." Yet, yeah. So I'm not convinced unless he sounds exactly like that, well, like he did in the cartoon. I'm no, no, I'm that's not, not. That's true. That's not quite what I meant. But yeah, that would be awesome if because Grimlock is a great character. Exactly. Grimlock's yes. awesome. He's you know, he's gruff, but he's a loyal dinosaur. Exactly. He's lovable. He's a good guy. So he's good guy. Lovable T Rex. But so you know when you go see Transformers. Uh, you'll, you'll see prepare op- for extinction. Yeah, prepare for. Uh, and again, they prepare. They could have had four. The number in four extinction. I yeah. don't get it. Like, what does age of extinction even mean? Like, can extinction have an age? Like, it seems like extinction is such a sort of like singular thing to occur. You can't have an age. It's not like you know, it's an age of extinction where it's like everything's just going extinct. Like it's, and I'm assuming they just are implying that it's just humanity because we only, you know, we're so fucking self-absorbed. We only give a shit about ourselves. Can you really have an age of extinction if human beings are the only people going extinct? No, I mean, really, exactly. Like I hope the movie is mostly about most of the species on the planet going extinct, and then, then you can kind, and over a very long protracted period of time, then it justifies itself being called Age of Extinction. Yeah. There's no way it justifies itself being called Age of Extinction. They just thought it sounded cool. You know, At least I, it's not Transformers Redemption or, like, Revelation or something. At least they didn't, like, you know, just come up with a fucking stock title for it. Transformers Resurrection. Yeah. Transformers The Wall, because, you know, they loved taking just, you no know, <laughs> Pink Floyd titles for the last movie. You know, I will say, I would watch a Transformers movie that took The Wall. Yeah. Like, like there's a Wall movie, but just took yeah. The Wall soundtrack and made a Transformers God, movie to match awesome. it. They should do that with, like, every Pink Floyd album. <laughs> It'd be crazy. Transformers, wish you were here. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, has anyone taken Dark Side, Dark of the Moon, and synced it with Dark Side of the Moon yet? That must have happened at some point. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. The first hour of Dark of the Moon, the movie, is awful, so if you just muted it and played Dark Side of the Moon over it and listened to the album and had fun, then you could come back in for the awesome action at the end. Yeah, Yeah, sure. Or you could just go listen to Dark Side of the Moon and then be done with it, you know. That's... (laughs) That's what I did. Okay. That's what I did. <laughs> Sounds good. So, anyway, that's that. Transformers is... Age of Extinction. That, I think it was funny how little response that trailer got from anyone. I didn't even like, know it happened. Yeah. Like, I didn't even know it. Like, I had no yeah. idea. It's like, and I'm, I'm sure yeah. it's going to make a lot of money because the other one's made... Uh, each one outgrossed the previous one, so... Who I'm knows? Still, I'm still holding out a hope somewhere deep in my heart that at some point it's just like... This is like one of the Transformers movies is going to come out and it's going to be the biggest bomb ever. And then Michael Bay, you know, just like leaves the country and never comes back. Gets deported like Justin Bieber? Exactly. All right. <laughs> Let's go on. So we've got some movie news to talk about. Right, yeah. And I'm actually going to do this in an alternate order than I have it on the outline. Okay. To go chronologically. Over kind of the, the break in January where we weren't podcasting, yes. um, some news broke about Edgar Wright's Ant-Man movie yes. that I'm sure we're both excited for. Yes. Because it's Marvel and it's Edgar Wright. And yes. Awesome. And it's Ant-Man. Yes. And uh, they they cast Paul Rudd in the movie, and at first we didn't know who he was playing. Was he yeah. going to be Hank Pym? Was he going to be... Scott Lang is the Scott, yeah. issue he's actually playing. Yeah. But we didn't know what the plan was, just Paul Rudd is going to be the star of Ant-Man. And, it's, you know, I like Paul Rudd, so yeah. no problems there. Uh, and then they, they kind of gave us full details, yeah. which is he is playing Scott Lang, and Michael Douglas is playing Hank Pym. So they're doing this a little differently than they've done, you know, previous Marvel movies, yeah. where we've got two versions of the hero, and uh, one of them is, is old. So we're, we're really implying that in the Marvel Universe, Hank Pym was the first... Yeah, that, that he already existed at some point, you know, fucking yeah. around doing stuff. And then eventually... And it's, it's, it's like, it's easy to believe because... You know, who notices Ant-Man, like, right. honestly. So, of course, he could have been around, and you don't have to reference the fact that there's some dude named Ant-Man doing shit, like, in the 80s or something, whatever. Right. It's not like Batman existing before Superman. In, yeah, that's yeah. It's completely fucked up, and, yeah. and I hate them for it. But what do you think of the casting? I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah it's, it seems like good casting to me. Yep. Like, I'm not, a, I'm not particularly invested in Ant-Man. Like, I don't... 
know a whole lot about Scott Lang. Like, I've mostly have read a lot of comics with Hank Pym because he's a much more major character in the universe. Although I think Scott Lang may have, may have actually been actually Ant-Man for longer because Hank Pym has had like five different superhero identities. So maybe fucking Michael Douglas is like yellow jacket in this movie for all I know. <laughs> like he might suit up, which would be awesome. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, cool. I lo- I, Michael Douglas is a really good actor. I really love Paul Rudd. I think Paul Rudd has the perfect kind of comedic energy to work in the Marvel Universe. Yeah. I like agree. I can see him being in an Avengers movie and being awesome. Yeah. So that's and he great. seems much more perfect. Like I, just, like I said, I don't know a whole lot about Scott Lang, but he, Paul Rudd would be a weird choice for Hank Pym. So I'm glad he's not Hank Pym. Yeah, but he could, yeah, he could probably be a fine Scott Lang because I don't know anything about that guy. And story wise, it sounds really fun and exciting to me to have. You know, the implication is that this is the kind of story where Scott Lang basically steals the Ant Man. Yeah, yeah, because that's how he gets it. Yeah. And it's just it sounds like a good story they're telling. Uh, you know, Edgar Wright wrote this script years and years and years ago, like a decade ago, and has been trying to get it made ever since. And when Marvel was not its own studio, no one would make it. Because it's an Ant-Man movie. Right, yeah. And and then Marvel Studios started, and he's been in discussions with them ever since, because they really wanted to make... He had a great... I guess he just had a, always had a really good pitch for Ant-Man. And hey, if there's a filmmaker out there who is super enthusiastic about, about Ant-Man, Ant-Man yeah. you lock that motherfucker down. Exactly. It gives me hope for the Pace Pop Pete movie that I'm sure <laughs> is going to happen at some point in the future. With Daniel Day-Lewis <laughs> as Pace Pop Pete. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> It'll happen. I don't It'll know. If we've, I don't know if we've ever shared our dreams know. for Paste Pot Pete on we the don't, podcast. We don't need to. It's, <laughs> okay. it's enough. All right, but no, I think this sounds good. There was uh, rumors yesterday that Evangeline Lilly is being cast as the female lead, so that movie's got a good cast coming together. Mm-hmm. And hey, Edgar Wright has made his four movies are four of my favorite movies ever. So yeah. I'm excited for this. But the news that you know once again made the internet go rah 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 rah. Yeah, like was, this sort of like dull roar every time you logged onto your computer. Yes. More Batman, Superman movie casting news. And one thing I want to say before we start talking about this. Yes. Again, I cannot invest in any of this because not yes. only is this movie years away, it's further years away because it's been delayed by a full year to summer oh, yeah. 2016. Mm-hmm. So we are a... Which, are, thank God for that because there are way too many fucking movies coming out in summer 2015. Yes. I would have had... The podcast would have just overloaded. Yes, it would have. And there are still a ton. 2015 yeah. is busy. But yes, they, they, they flinched. They were not going to have that movie the same summer as Avengers Yeah, they 2. saw Star Wars coming and like, we're getting the fuck out of the way of that motherfucker. Jesus! <laughs> yeah, well anyway, so it's, it's into 2016, but I guess they're not delaying shooting or anything. So they're just going to have it done really early. Uh, whatever. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but they, they announced some casting news. Uh, Jeremy Irons will be playing Alfred. Bruce Which Wayne's the most significant thing to that to me is like, fucking Alfred's going to be in the movie too. Like, yeah. is every Batman character... In the movie now, like fucking Dick Grayson, Alfred, <laughs> Batman, like Vicky Vale's gonna be in it. Yes. All the Robins are going to be in it. We just didn't know that yet. Rachel Ghoul and Talia is gonna pop up somewhere. <laughs> Alright, yeah, so I mean The fucking Penny Plunderer. Like that's how deep they're gonna go. The Penny Plunderer is gonna show up. It's gonna be the origin story of the Penny in the Batcave. Jeremy Irons as Alfred, what does that strike you as? Seems weird. It seems weird. It's actually, and it's weird because we'll talk about the other bit of casting, which was much more controversial, which is what yeah. everyone was talking about. Jeremy Irons as Alfred, I would never have picked that. Jeremy Irons does not seem like an Alfred and to I, me at all. And I love, love Jeremy Irons. Yeah. yeah, he's a great actor. But he's here's what I <laughs> thought: Jeremy Irons is too forceful to, yeah, me, to be Alfred. He's like a scary dude. Yeah. You know, he's fucking Scar in The Lion King. Like I can't see Scar in The Lion King and Alfred being the same person, or the villain from Die Hard Three and Alfred being the same fucking dude. And this is what I'll say about Jeremy Irons: I think. When he's in that middle range, playing someone sort of very scary but kind of quietly scary, yeah. or very, you know, when he does straight dramatic performances, he can be just fantastic. No, you know, nobody's like Jeremy Irons. When he goes really far one way or the other, though, like really toned down and quiet or really batshit crazy, he's kind of insufferable. And I feel like he would have to tone it down to be Alfred to a point where why even have Jeremy Irons? Yeah, exactly. It is, and it's a thing with like as opposed to the other bit of casting, like this one, I can see it in my head because I feel like Jeremy Irons has a very like specific presence and acting style This just does not mesh with Alfred and then also it's kind of you know Michael Caine was such a good Alfred that well Michael Caine is the perfect kind of actor where he has a presence but he's not forceful he's exactly not... like he's such a he was such a good Alfred like he was yeah. a perfect Alfred in the sense especially right. for those movies like that yeah. style of Batman that's like I don't even know why we need another Alfred. Like, I don't know why you need to bring in the Batman supporting cast into this fucking Superman movie. 
Yeah. But yeah. I mean, there's going to be more Batman characters than Superman characters yeah, at this point. Yeah, like, you know, fucking Jimmy Olsen doesn't even get to be in the fucking movie, but Alfred does. Like, what the fuck is up with that? You don't even get the whole Superman supporting cast, but Batman gets to bring his fucking butler. Jesus Christ. <laughs> what other actors would you have pegged for Alfred? I'm just, as a thought exercise. I don't know. Like, I'm not good at, like, the okay. hypothetical casting thing, but... <laughs> Philip Seymour fucking... Hoffman is Alfred. Yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman is... I mean, he actually would, because he could play any character. He would, he could be fucking Batman. He could be Superman. He would have been an amazing Lex Luthor. Or he could have been Alfred. Oh, good. That makes yeah, me so exactly, sad right? to think about. He would have been an amazing Lex Luthor. Well, anyway, let's go on to that next bit of news. Yes. This is the controversial part. Uh, Jesse Eisenberg of the social network Adventureland, Zombieland He was in two movies consecutively called Land Interesting, yeah. I had not made that connection before Jesse Land Eisenberg Yes He's known in the biz <laughs> Right Jesse Eisenberg has been cast as a character who will be called Lex Luthor Yes What do you think? Well, the thing is, I never saw the social network So when, so when this news came out My reference point for Jesse Eisenberg is basically like Zombieland okay. And so, initially I was like what? Fucking Jesse Eisenberg? And then I remembered that he played Mark Zuckerberg in The Social Network, which I did not see. Everybody really liked him in that. Yeah. So no, he is a he, Yeah, so I'm, I can't really comment on it. Like, this and, is what I was yeah. going to say, is that clearly they are doing something so different with yeah. Lex Luthor, I have to wait to see. And, and if they're doing something different, look, Jesse Eisenberg is a great actor, and in The Social Network there are scenes where he is quietly menacing in ways that could work very well, where you could feasibly see him staring down... Superman with the confidence Lex Luthor uses to stare down Superman. Yeah. So we'll see. I, you know, although when they announced this news, they really should have just had like a picture of him with his head, head shaved. Like they needed to do that. They needed to, you know, give us a little something like just cut off all his fucking hair well, and is, have that with the press release. Is he even going to be bald? Who knows? I he's, if he's not then he's not what's bald. then what's the point? I mean, I know Gene Hackman wasn't bald. Jesse Eisenberg's not fucking Gene Hackman. Yeah. Like he doesn't get to keep his fucking hair If Gene Hackman Gene Hackman got to keep his hair Jesse Eisenberg doesn't deserve that much You know <laughs> Well yeah and, and you know I think I think Lex Luthor could be a fascinating character In the next movie Just because of that That obvious plot element of him yeah. Rising to power off of the, the kind of Superman destroy- you know Committing genocide on the species And destroying half of Manhattan Yeah that he, part He did not destroy half of Manhattan The villains did Him, him Stop them Sure Well sure Sure. Again, Superman in could not some way, that. Superman is somewhat culpable for the act, for the destruction in that film. Or he, he could have stood by and let and just let them do it. And no, or he could have them. kept them from doing it at all if he had used his fucking head. He's Superman. How? Okay, we're not. By flying into- away. What do you mean? You could fucking. We're not getting into. The- we have a podcast. A Go lot into of the archive. A lot of the city destruction happens before Superman can even get there. Because sure. he has to, yeah, he has to go destroy the other world engine at the other end of the planet. But Superman has the fucking yeah, whatever. Okay, <laughs> we don't need to. We have a whole podcast about that shitty fucking movie. Let's I, not get into it here. Anyway, but yes, so yeah, it's it's just something where uh, this is this is the uh, the thing I tweeted when I heard about this. I I and this is not me saying that I'm opposed to this casting in any way, but I I put on Twitter I said if people are not more outraged by this than they were at Ben Affleck, I'm going to lose all faith in humanity. Yeah, because exactly. here's the thing. Ben Affleck is such a like a totally fine casting choice right. for Batman, and this one is actually sort of odd. Like it's not an actor that you would ever think would be playing Lex Luthor. No, and Ben Aff- like there is no reinvention of Batman going exactly. on when you cast Ben Affleck. That's that's Batman. You're not doing something radical with it. When you yeah. cast Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor, that could be fantastic. We'll see. But that is radical and different. And at least so far, I have not seen the same amount of hate. Oh, it's not even close. Which pisses yeah. me off because that is so stupid. It's like I don't. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. It's like it's kind of like you know when we talked about that bit of casting too. It's like I kind of feel the same way about this. It's like I don't give a shit about casting news like I have to see the performance I have no idea like if Jesse Eisenberg is trying to play Lex Luthor like Clancy Brown did in the animated series like no like that would not (laughs) right that's not going to work like he does not have that physicality they put him in old age makeup for media style exactly yeah like he can't do that but who fucking knows what they're doing yeah and besides I've lost all faith in that fucking movie Already So I don't give a shit You know They could have a fucking cat Playing Lex Luthor With its head shaved For all I care Like I've I've already given up At this point Based Uh, on everything I've seen about it Meow Luthor I can see the character poster now Exactly 
<laughs> all right, so that's all the movie news we have to go through. Yeah. Uh, so let's see what else we got to talk about. There's some game news. Yes, there is. Quick addendums to our 2014 preview discussions. Right. Um, first off, Murdered Soul Suspect, which we're both Murdered excited. Murdered Soul Suspect. Which we're both excited for. It's yes. coming to PS4 and Xbox One. Thank God. Yeah. I don't have yeah. to use the DualShock 3 to play it. Mm-hmm. Yay. So, that's coming to PS4. That's that's cool. Um, Murdered. Still excited to play it. Still the fucking best title for a video game ever, as far as I'm concerned. And here's a bit of news that made me laugh out loud. Metal Gear Solid Five, the prequel game. What's it yeah, called? Uh, Ground Zero. Ground Zero. As opposed to the Phantom Pain. Reports are it is less than two hours long. Yeah. So, and it will have a physical release. And this was the funniest part I learned. The physical release is ten dollars more than digital. <laughs> for some reason. Yeah. So you know, hey, if you're into Metal Gear Solid, probably pick that one up digital. Seems yeah. to be the seems to be the message to get from there. So that's just kind of funny. Yeah. Um, Oh, I, I, I have I have a little thing that we don't have on the outline that I noticed earlier okay. today. Something a tragic thing that I, I missed to put on to our what we're looking forward to this year. It's partially because this game actually was localized over here last year, but it was on the PS3. Now, Hatsune Miku Project Diva F is coming to the Vita in America, which is amazing. What's Hatsune Miku Project Diva X? Okay, so Hatsune Miku. I'm, I could go super deep into this. I'll try to keep it as surface level as possible. Is this going to be like when you first explained what Persona 4 was and you Almost. talked for 45 minutes? So, in Japan, a, a couple of years, I think in like 2003, a computer program came out called Vocaloid. And Vocaloid is basically a text-to-speech program, except for it's more text-to-song, where you, you, know, you type in text and you create music using it, effectively. And anybody could download it and create their own songs. And it's, like I said, it came out in Japan, hugely popular. And Hatsune Miku was a character that was, it was a voice for, like, the, the program. And then also, like, a full character design to sort of try to sell it. And it became immensely, immensely popular in Japan. It's been immensely popular for years. And so a bunch of Japanese people, like, have created songs using the character and their own instrumentation. And put it on, like, Japanese YouTube, basically. And, like, it's so crazy that there are, like, concerts where you have an actual band of actual people on a stage playing actual music and then this sort of like glass cube thing with a hologram of Hatsune Miku in it (laughs) dancing and singing these songs like and it's you have to go up on YouTube and watch some videos of the concert because it's like Blade Runner has already happened and it's fucking awesome because there's a bunch of people watching a hologram sing music it is so fucking cool and some of the songs are actually kind of okay but then it became so popular that they made a series of rhythm games that are tied oh a bunch of different God. titles. And so, and Hatsune Miku Project Diva F is the first one to get localized over here. It's uh, published by Sega, and it got localized and got put on the PS3, and now it's on the Vita. But the, what's important about this is that the developers of the new game Persona 4 Dancing All Night are the same people who developed the Hatsune Miku games. So, if the Hatsune Miku games are localized and come out over here, and if they make money, then... Sega obviously has a clear incentive for putting out Persona 4 Dancing all night. So we are both buying this day one. Exactly, yes. And we are going to review it on the podcast and sing its praises. Exactly. I am so excited to play this game, Sean. You did a good sales pitch there. Yeah, so, and and I should say, because I've listened to a handful of Hatsune Miku songs, and most of them are like, uh, kind of okay. There's one Hatsune Miku song that's really good. It's called Rolling Girl. I highly recommend you look it up. It's really fucking good, so. Nice. Hatsune Miku. Project Eva F coming to the PS Vita soon. Well, all right. That's I, my new most anticipated game of the year. Yeah, it was a tragic mistake that I left that off. So Okay, so let's talk about some new video game news. All right. Uh, first up, today, while we're recording this podcast on, what is today, February 5th, 6th? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, a new Sonic video game for the Wii U and 3DS was announced called Sonic Boom in yeah. conjunction with the upcoming Cartoon Network TV series Sonic Boom. Where, yeah, and she, she just mentioned, because this is something that came up last time, we were talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Tur- Turtles, Sonic has the same thing, where I always feel like there is a Sonic the Hedgehog television show that is somehow ongoing, that I have absolutely no exposure to, and then I see it once and I kind of cry inside. And yet... And this is happening again. Right, and with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, it seems like they've kept a fairly good quality. Yeah, yeah, they seem to always be kind of good. Like, if your kid watches Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles now, they're, they're, they're okay. Yeah. But if they watch a Sonic show now, they will go deaf from the horrible voices drilling yeah. into their brains. Yeah, the voice acting is not... They're no. not good voices for those characters. No, not at all. So, 
Yeah, Sonic Boom. Uh, <laughs> so named for the amazing song at the beginning of the American version of Sonic CD, oh, which so is good. you know it's something you're kind of tarnishing that amazing song by naming a game oh, after it. It's probably not going to be a good game. No, this is going by the track record of Sonic games. Just you know, historical statistics. It's probably not going to be good. So Sonic Boom is doing t- continuing two trends and con- and starting some new trends that are all baffling. Yeah. First trend. They're going with the art style overall, that really cartoony, colorful, like very flat art style of Sonic Lost World, which yeah. nobody liked at all. Mm-hmm. And they're putting it out on Wii U where nobody will buy it at all. Yeah, apparently so, they didn't see Nintendo's most recent forecast. So. Yeah. And it's, it's only Wii U and 3DS. So maybe the 3DS version will sell okay, although I don't think Lost World did very well on the 3DS. I have no idea. I think being tied to the Wii U is kind of a poison for that. Um... And, and Boom will be the same way, I assume, so that's weird. But most notably, New Trend, they have, for the first time in a really long time for the Sonic series, they have redesigned all the characters. Yeah. And made them look as lame as possible. Yes. So, you know so, how Sonic used to look cool? Yes. I now mean, yeah, were, yeah, back in the 90s, yes, I remember when he had a really awesome design. Right, and that was the best one, but even in the 3D world, you know, he looked, he looked good. He yeah. didn't look, you know, as cool as he once did, but he looked good in his middle age. However, the new Sonic wears a fucking scarf... And is weirdly yeah. skinny and tall. It's not really a scarf. It's more like he was, did like the thing where you have a bandana that you wear around your mouth so that you don't like you know get caught because everyone recognizes people by the shape of their chin apparently. Right. But then you just put it around your neck. Like that's what it is. It's not a fucking scarf. Everyone's been calling it a scarf. I've seen scarves. Yeah. Fucking Tom Baker. He wears a goddamn scarf. This is not a scarf. Anyway, he looks stupid. Yes, his and arms are really long, like really long, and a continuing a strange trend in Sonic redesigns. His Sonic gets his legs get longer and longer, like proportionally to his body. His legs are like as long as his torso is now, where they yeah. used to be like relatively small legs. Now it's like almost his entire body mass is in his legs. Yeah. It kind of makes sense because he's fast, but also just looks really fucking weird and stupid. Yeah. Amy and Tails look okay, although everyone in this game looks like they're made out of plastic in an early Super Smash Bros. Yeah. game. So. I should also say that like they've done a thing with Sonic's like spikes, where it looks like he has bed head because it's like he has like little tiny spikes sticking out between his big spikes. It's just kind of like not yeah. necessarily bad, just like it's kind of funny. It looks like he forgot to go to his stylist. Yeah. So, but the worst offender by far is they took Knuckles, bent him over a table, <laughs> and like just him. raped him. Which is. Yeah, the redesign of Knuckles is so bad. For It's basically, you know, Knuckles used to be, he was basically the same proportional size of Sonic. I think he was a little bit shorter than Sonic, but then he had, you know, he has fucking spikes on his hands, and he's got little, like, cool, like, metal things on the top of his shoes, and he's got dreadlocks, and it's Knuckles. In Sonic 3 and Knuckles, when they introduced that character, he was so fucking cool. Knuckles was the fucking shit. And then now, he's fucking shit. Because it's like, because apparently, you know, because they this is kind of a trend that started with Sonic Heroes, where they had to sort of figure out, because they had, like, team-based stuff, how to make Knuckles seem especially distinct from everyone else. So he got, like, thrown into this, like, strength class of character that did not exist before. Because he used to be just a little bit slower than Sonic, and that was it. And he jumped a little bit lower, but he could glide and, like, punch through blocks, and so it was fine, and you could climb. And then he just got lumped in as, like, he's the dumb, strong one because Tails suddenly became a fucking genius and he got an airplane. I guess he always kind of had an airplane. Sonic was the fast one, so Knuckles has to be the strong one. And so now, continuing that trend, all of a sudden, if you look at Knuckles, like, picture, like, I'm going to describe Knuckles' character design to you as if, like, you're seeing it in a movie. So it starts at the feet and it's panning up. It's totally normal. He's still... He's got the basically the normal shoes. I think they have, like, like bandages on, like, sports tape on them now, like Sonic's does. And then it kind of starts going up. Still seems fine. You know, his legs are a little bit long, and they're, but they're thin, like Sonic character legs have always been. Keep on going up. You can get to the waist. Okay, normal, normal. And then you get, like, about halfway up his torso, and then all of a sudden, everything's sort of, like, jutting out at this, like, very obtuse angle. And you're like, huh, that's weird. And then you pan up more... And then all of a sudden you see his shoulders are fucking huge. Like, he's built like a goddamn football player. And then his head is like a big fucking orange. And he doesn't have a neck at all. There's no neck. And he has the Sonic World equivalent of dreadlocks now. Yeah, it's, but they're, yeah, they're not cool looking. Like, the dreadlocks are really bad. His head is so fucking... You know, it's like Carl Pilkington. His that. head is round. It's, it's yeah. He's like, he's got wavy hair in these screenshots. It's... It's, yeah. Like, Knuckles... 
it's so tragic because he used to be so cool and now he looks like some dumb thug, like minion character. Like he doesn't look like a main character at all anymore. He's the dumb strong one. It's like Knuckles was the fucking cool anti-hero. Like in Sonic 3, like he was the dude you ran into and like you had no idea who he was, but he had this cool theme music and then he would like hit a button and try to stop you because Eggman tricked him. Like that's that's who Knuckles is. Now he's just some dumb bruiser. It's fucking stupid. It is. The game does not look particularly good. Uh, the redesigns are awful. The voice work is awful. The yeah, trailer... it's the same voice actors from like when they reassigned voice actors from that Sonic X show came out. They've been the same since then. The worst moment in Sonic history. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're still calling Robotnik Eggman. That's just fucking stupid. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I can't wait to see how they redesign Robotnik. If they, if they, if you, if, like, is this? It's coming out with a TV show as well, so if you watch the TV show trailer, that has Robotnik in it, uh, and he, he basically looks the same. He has no real redesign. Okay. Well, anyway, um, doesn't look particularly good. We will see, except when neither yeah. of us will play it. Like, and one weird thing about it is that if you like look at it, the logo comes up, and it's first it's Sega, and then it's Big Red Button, which is not a video game developer that I think has ever made a game before, although it is headed up by a... By someone who is ex Naughty Dog from like the Uncharted days, which is where I think the the little like bandana scarf comes from because uh, Nathan Drake wore that too. So I, I don't know. But then also there was an issue I read on Polygon like they have a big write up about it. So if you want to see more about it, go on Polygon. And uh, they talked like the they had an executive from, from Sega talking about how this is like their push to like make Sonic more relevant in the West again. So it's like, it is Big Red Button is a Western developer. The show is only coming out in America so far. Like, there's no plans for either of these things coming out in Japan necessarily. And Sonic has historically been bigger in America than he ever was in Japan. Yeah. Um, that's kind of always been the story with him. They could never get him to break out in the way, you know, Mario broke out in Japan. Yeah. But they could get him to break out here. So, it's weird. Uh, you should, however, absolutely watch the Sonic Boom video game trailer. Preferably with yeah. friends so you can laugh at it. Because yeah. when it goes into the dubstep thing... God, game, the dubstep is so stupid. But then it does end with a cool sandworm thing. I, I have a big fondness of sandworms ever since I <laughs> watched Dune and then read Dune. All right. Actually, that was the reverse order. So you heard it here first. Sean will be buying a Wii U to play the sandworm level in Sonic No, Boom. I was implying that I was going to watch Dune after we finished this. Oh, well... Because you should watch Dune like about once a year. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Uh, next week, all Dune, all the time yeah. podcast. Exactly. Yes, the Dune cast, you could call it. Yeah. We have worms sign the likes even God has never seen. All right. Two other little brief bits of news that I thought were funny. Yeah. Or interesting in weird ways. Uh, Call of Duty will... They have now split... Uh, Activision announced today that they're going to have Treyarch, um, Infinity Ward, and now Sledgehammer Games all developing games independently. So yeah, they so won't... it's a three-year cycle now instead of a two-year cycle. So the game that's coming out this year is not a Treyarch game. It is Sledgehammer's first, like, their own solo game. game debut. Because they, they helped on Modern Warfare 3 and I think did, like, DLC stuff like Raven Software right. does. So but now they're making their own games. It will still be annualized, but every game will get three years of work on it. Which could be good. Uh, we'll yeah. see. Um, you know, if anything, it, it, what it really shows is that Activision has no intention of slowing down this Call yeah, of Duty train. Exactly. Like they're like they're they're all committing in. everything. Like it is astounding to me that Call of Duty as a franchise is now so huge that they can have three large AAA developers simultaneously working on this series at the same time, like clockwork for the foreseeable future. Like that is fucking. Amazing, because they used to be they had like you know they have small, small smaller studios still working on the DLC, but now it's like three full studios working on full like sequels for this franchise is fucking incredible. Yes, and I will say I feel like, however, if they want to keep this up, they're they're gonna Sledgehammer and Trey or and uh, Infinity Ward are gonna have to up their game because nobody liked Ghosts. People were very very mediocre on that, and yeah. I don't think it did not set records the way Black Ops did. Yeah, it didn't. Had a very muted reception. Sledgehammer made Modern Warfare 3, which was really the first kind of critical turnaround on that series in a major way. Yeah. Where I feel like overall people were really lukewarm on that. It's mm -hmm. a very boring Call of Duty game overall. Um, while, while people still like the Treyarch games. You know, Black Ops 2 got really, really good reception. Yeah. And apparently you did some fun stuff with multiplayer and whatnot. So we shall see. Um, I, guess, I guess that means we'll be getting like a Ghost 2, Modern Warfare 4, who knows. Yeah, well, we'll be getting Ghost 2, Black Ops 3, and then Call of Duty, whatever the fuck they're calling this one. Call of Duty Sledgehammer, where you go around, sure. you just have a sledgehammer? Yeah. yeah, that's why they named the studio that. Right. 
Hey, I'd, I'd play a, a game where you just, just, just one, yeah. it's like dive kick. You <laughs> sledgehammer. It's just one button. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. And then the only other thing I wanted to note, another Activision news, is they announced that they are projecting Destiny to be the uh, yeah. best-selling game in history. Yeah, Bobby Kotick, the CEO of Activision, said this. After Nintendo taught us last week about the danger of ridiculous, um, like, um, what's the word? I don't know. What, what is the word? Bird? Uh, Bird's the word. Bird is not the word. Projections. After, like, oh. ridiculous financial project- projections Nintendo made for the Wii U and 3DS yeah. that were completely unattainable, I'm going to go on the record and say best-selling game in history is kind of a ridiculous thing to, to have a new yeah, especially IP. Especially, like, when, you know, Grand Theft Auto V just came in. Like, Grand Theft Auto V, I saw recently, sold, like, it's, like... 26 sold, million. Yeah, it sold, like, 32 million. Maybe, yeah, higher. I think it's, I think it's 32. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. nuts. And, you know... <laughs> Minecraft is out there. How much has that sold? That's, I don't know. It Everything. sold. Ten, it sold ten million on PS3 infinite, just in infinite, December. Infinite copies. Like yeah. it just goes. Yeah. So I don't really. I love. I love. I'm excited for Destiny. I yeah, love Bungie. I'm, I'm gonna fucking buy it. But... Yeah. I just. I think that's kind of funny as a projection. Yeah. It's just like it's just something. It's like that would be like if someone it's such a CEO thing to do. I don't know. That would be like if Disney yeah. said we are projecting Star Wars Episode Seven will outgross Avatar. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's like, like don't say that. It could. Who knows? Yeah. But don't say that. Yeah. Anyway, so that was kind of funny. But, Chances uh, are you're going to be wrong. Just statistically speaking, yeah, you're probably not going to be right. So that's all the news we've got to talk about today. Any other stuff before we get on to the main event, main topic uh, here? I don't know. I think you know. I think bringing up Hasne Miku that was. I really wanted to get that in. But, no, yeah. I think that's that's what I'm gonna like. That's the photo with this podcast. It's gonna have to be Hasne Miku. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, Anyway, but let's talk about our main topic today, which is the third series of Sherlock. This is the BBC show that airs three episodes every two years. Yes. And we got... Starring Smaug and Bilbo. Yes. Smaug, the Smaug and Bilbo Adventure uh, Detective Hour. Exactly. Yeah. Hour and a half, I guess. But anyway, yes. We've been waiting two years for Sherlock to return. All three episodes have aired. We're going to talk about all the episodes together, individual. We'll see how this goes. Yeah. But make sure you've seen the season before you listen to this. Um... I think the first thing we should talk about here, Sean... Yes. Um, Sherlock has been off the air so long, you and I have never shared our thoughts on the series on this podcast. That's true. Because, the, the, yeah, the, was, the last season aired was like before we even did WGTC it's, Radio, right? Uh, before WGTC Radio, definitely. And I think it was the month, like the monthly 10 started or something. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, it's been a long time. Yeah. So... In any case, what are what have your thoughts been historically on Sherlock pre season three? Yeah. Okay. So I guess I should like first just note that I've read like every Sherlock Holmes story and I've seen most of like the major Sherlock Holmes movies and I've watched all of the Granada Television Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes episodes, which are almost all of the stories adapted for television, and it's fucking amazing. If you have not seen those, I highly recommend because Jeremy Brett is the best Sherlock Holmes bar none. But and Edward Hardwick is also the best. Well, okay, he and Watson, or he and uh, Martin Freeman, can fight for the best Watson because they're both really great. Yeah, but yeah, so I fucking love Sherlock Holmes. I'm a big fan of like murder mystery fiction in general. Like it's it's one of my passions, kind of. So that's sort of me going into Sherlock already having all that Sherlock Holmes history under my belt, and I've loved this show. Like I thought, I think it's a, you know, of especially because when Sherlock started was around the time that Robert Downey Jr. movie came out, and it was like. It was there could not, in my opinion, have been a more stark difference in how I thought like it would be a good way to sort of like make the character work in modern times and a bad way for the character to work in modern times. Now, obviously, the Robert Downey Jr. movie that's not actually literally set in modern times, but is a modern take on the character with right. like him fighting people and that kind of shit and like the dumb jokes that they threw in the, those movies. And that movie was not terrible; like it was okay. But I didn't like it as a Sherlock Holmes thing. Whereas Sherlock, when when it came out and I watched that first series. I thought it was a really, really smart way to sort of update the character, have bring it into modern times, especially the way they use Watson. I think Martin Freeman has always been my favorite part of the show because I've always thought Watson was a really misunderstood character. That's why I really love Edward Hardwick in the, the Granada television ones because it's like, he's a really good Watson and most of the Watson you see are so shit because we had this idea of Watson being this bumbling oaf when he's actually... You know, he was in a fucking... He was in a fucking war. He's an army doctor, goddammit. He's fucking killed people and saved people's lives. He is one of the most fucking competent people you could find. That's why Sherlock keeps him around. And this show understood that immediately. You know, the first episode, 
introduce is introduced like you follow fucking Watson and he encounters Sherlock. It takes the study of Scarlet like model. Yeah, especially like especially the beginning of it. It basically right. kind of follows that, but updated in modern times and you know instead of you know he's was in like the modern Afghan war and stuff like that. It's really smart the way they use technology and Sherlock now uses technology. The sort of like projection thing they do on screen to present the the deduction aspect of the show. I thought all of that was really well done. And so I loved Series 1, with the exception of the very end of the third episode of Series 1, where they introduced their Moriarty, and I have always fucking hated their Moriarty. I think their Moriarty is terrible. And then going into Series 2, I also really like Series 2, especially the Irene Adler. I think that episode, the first episode of Series 2, is the best one they've done so far. And then the other ones I liked as well with the exception again of I didn't think the third episode was bad but it was all Moriarty focused and I don't like their Moriarty so that put a downer on that one so that's that's where you're coming from that's that's where I'm coming from for this series yeah so I mean I agree with most of what you just said because I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan too I love the the books and and the short stories I you know own those thick tomes that's everything I've got like this awesome like bound one over there that's the complete Sherlock Holmes it's great yeah, so those are, I mean, I, the Sherlock Holmes are great. It's If you've never read the short stories before, it's awesome because you can just take like 15 minutes between yeah. classes and read these mysteries. They're really engaging. They, they're totally page turners. Yeah. They're really fun. Arthur Conan Doyle is just a really good pulp writer yeah. in that style, but with characters that really matter and have weight, and they're very clever. You know, it's just, he definitely he has a voice for how these characters interact. It, it feels yeah. very modern even as it's, Definitely written in this style that's contemporary to the times it was made in, but it doesn't feel like they've aged in any sort of bad way. Yeah, and actually, I just like remembered this is because I was reminded of this because I'm reading some late 19th century literature in for one of my classes, and I remembered that in the late 19th century in the Victorian era, they used the word ejaculated as in they said something. <laughs> right. So there are common instances frequently throughout the Sherlock Holmes stories of Watson ejaculated. <laughs> At the end of him saying something, and that's <laughs> always just great humor value taken in a modern context. There's nothing better than Watson being really surprised, shouting something out, and then he says he ejaculated at the end. So, <laughs> well, that's you know, if you take it literally, it's just when Watson says things, he has he's a very excitable man, is what we're saying, right. Did you know one of the Harry Potter books uses the ejaculated term for speech once? No, I have no idea. It's And I was old enough when that book came out to be like, what the fuck are they talking about? I hadn't read 19th century literature. It was yeah. like, what the hell is this? But anyway, yeah. So no, love the stories. They're awesome. You should totally read them. Um, and I had not, I honestly have, have never watched a ton of Sherlock Holmes adaptations. I really, he's like the most adapted character ever. ever. Yeah. Um, but like, I really want to see the Granada television one yeah, someday. Yeah, so fucking good. They look really good. But I think they were taken off Netflix and I never got really? around to seeing oh, that them. Sucks. So, yeah, maybe I'll get the DVDs sometime. But yeah, I would really love to see those because I, I, there's as much as he's been adapted, there aren't enough just straight adaptations of the stories. Yeah, they're usually like because he's in the public domain, like there's yeah. tons of like just non canonical, like random. Yeah. different Sherlock Holmes stories and shit. Yeah, so the only thing I would disagree with you on, on, on a lot of that is actually that I do like the first Robert Downey Jr. movie a lot. I think it's a good movie. I hate the second one. The second one is an yeah, abomination. Yeah, I never saw the second one. hate everything about it. I really do like that first movie, and I think it does some interesting things. But there's no question, when that came out, like the same month that Sherlock debuted, Sherlock blew it out of the water. Yeah. <laughs> because that the first episode of Sherlock is great, and I think that first season is really, really good all throughout. Um... You know, even that second episode, a lot of people I think have have put down. For me, I like the blind baker. Yeah. That second, like one I think, that. like I, my opinion on that one is just like it's okay, but I think it's sandwiched in between what I find two much more interesting episodes, and it sort of feels a little bit dull. To me. And I never even felt that because what I liked was it just felt like a good case of the week where we got a good feel. Yeah, like for I how, know, like I'm agreeing with you on yeah. that part, but it's like that makes it's a fun, enjoyable episode to watch, but it's not yeah. remarkable to me. So I kind of forget about it. Right, and that's that's fair. That's totally fair. But yeah, that first season to me is is really really strong throughout. It's very consistent And while I don't like their Moriarty at all I, I really heavily detest him yeah, yeah, When it aired terrible. When it aired I was actually willing to Kind of air judgment on that to later Because I thought that scene worked as a scene Like it was suspenseful The surprise worked even though he was annoying Like it worked on enough levels where I was like I can hold off judgment to this And then we get to the Reichenbach fall And he's the most annoying person on the planet And, and then I can go in retrospect and say I, It's awful but I hated it at the time. Okay, I, there was no retrospective when I saw him walk out, and it's like because at first I thought it was like, oh shit, that dude's Moriarty because he popped up 
earlier right. in the episode, like making himself seem like a different character. And he pops up at the end. It's like, oh, so that weird, awkward, like effeminate gay performance he was giving that was like a mask, and it's like, no. This weird, awkward, effeminate performance, that's just Moriarty. This, like, performance that is completely non-threatening, that's just Moriarty. Okay, fuck you! And it was also right when I was watching, like, the third season of Doctor Who, Modern Who, where it's like, they fucked up the Master. The Master and Moriarty are such similar characters in their original form. It's like watching both of these great, classic, traditional villains be just ruined by this really awful idea of what a modern villain should be to try to make them, like, jokery in a way. It's fucking disgusting. It's abhorrent to me. It's abhorrent, and season two of Sherlock starts with uh, one of my favorite episodes of modern television. It's, you know, the the scandal in Belgravia is a fantastic... It it is what Sherlock can achieve at its best. It's got great character work between Sherlock and Watson, Um, especially as a character study for Sherlock. It's the best the show is... Has ever been until the third season for me, but we'll get to that. I think it's got some great, especially with his interactions with Irene Adler. Yeah. That's that's Benedict Cumberbatch at his best, you know, kind mm-hmm. of digging into this character in this modern setting. Yeah, um, I like their Hound of the Baskerville kind of spin on, you yeah. know, their their spin on that story. Uh, that's the second episode of series two. It's good. I it's kind of like the Blind Baker. I like the Blind Baker better of those two. My only major problem with Hound of the Baskerville is that it's. That one is the one of the episodes of Sherlock that really feels stretched to me, like the 90 minutes was way too much. But I have nothing huge against it. It's got some good character work in it, too. Yeah. Um, I was okay. I, I was very uncomfortable with it at the time, the Reichenbach fall, the finale. Um, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it all that much. I had a lot of issues with it. I finally watched it again in preparation for Series 3, and I strongly dislike that episode. Mm-hmm. There's There's... Almost nothing about it I like, except Cumberbatch and Freeman are really good, and I think they are so good, they almost cover up some of the flaws for me, and they did on the first viewing, like the final scene when Sherlock jumps and they have that phone conversation. That scene almost, that scene worked for me the first time, didn't the second time when you realize so much of it is gibberish and it's all going to be rug pulled out from under you yeah. and there's a lot of issues with it for me. But So I really don't like that. I think that is honestly Stephen Moffat kind of... Stephen Moffat didn't write that one. I think Stephen, yeah, Stephen Thompson, like the third guy who writes the off episodes. Did he write that one? Yeah, Stephen Moffat wrote Scandal in Belgravia, Martin mm-hmm. Gatiss did the Baskervilles one, and then Stephen Thompson did the finale that year, oh. I think, um, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, so I don't, I don't like that one. I think the plot is complete and utter gibberish throughout, and it just, it does, it does not strike me as a Sherlock Holmesian mystery in any way, shape, or form. And Moriarty is so annoying, I wanted to throw stuff at my TV yeah. every five minutes. Like, for me, I don't, like, have an issue with the plot of that one. I think it's totally fine. Like, I don't love that episode a whole lot. Like, I thought, at the time, I thought it was interesting, but then I rewatched like, the whole series in preparation for Series 3, because I hadn't rewatched any of them since I watched them originally. And then, like, my second viewing... I didn't like it as much as my first one, but I also I don't think it's like that bad. It's, but I, I hate the Moriarty. To me, that is a bad episode, and I don't yeah. like it. And the the other thing is that at the time, and then when I rewatched it, I did not like the way they did the cliffhanger where he yeah, jumps, like, but they do it in such full view where it's like the only way they can explain this away is through complete bullshit because we see him jump, we yeah. follow him the whole way, he splats. There is no room it's whatsoever. Like, it's like the end of The Dark Knight Rises where they cut to yeah. Batman in the bat plane or the bat wing right before the nuke blows up and it's like, using the conventional language of film, there's literally no way Batman could possibly have survived in this situation. So the only way to believe he did is to just assume that you were intentionally lying to us and showing it out of order. Right. It's like, it's fucking, that's fucking bullshit. It I is. agree with you. Sherlock, the last episode of that season definitely does that. And so it annoyed me in that way, again, because we've got two years to wait for this thing. Yeah. So that's leading into series three, and you may be surprised by our reactions to this, just from where we're each coming from. But I want to watch. Who should start? What? Who should start? Who should start? Should start series about three? You just keep on going. Okay, I'll, go, I'll keep on going. So I'll say, coming in, and again, coming into Series 3, not liking that cliffhanger and dreading what we were going to get with it, I really, really liked Series 3. I would have to rewatch all the series in context to say this. It might be my favorite of the three. Mm-hmm. I definitely like it more than Series 2. It is at least on par in a lot of ways for Series 1 with me. This was a really different season for the show. Yeah. They went, they de-emphasized plot in a lot of ways and went for character. And the whole season kind of felt, in a lot of ways, like this victory lap where they were celebrating the characters and their relationships. And honestly, if I just say that to myself, it sounds like something that would not have worked for me. 
but I very much liked the execution this season more than I was expecting to. Um, I think dealing with the, I think the, again the way they had set up Sherlock and Watson in the first two seasons, I think that was the great strength of the series. Yeah. While they did all these smart things in modernizing it and doing Holmesian stories in these ninety-minute settings and whatnot, I do think the best thing Sherlock had going for it was these two performances and the way they built these characters and this relationship. And so, and and what I thought in series two was that plot in those last two episodes, and especially in Reichenbach Fall, kept getting in the way of that relationship to where I didn't think that last moment between Sherlock and Watson on the roof was earned in any way, shape, or form. I thought they were, and I thought a lot of series two did a lot of this kind of, it's kind of they started doing this in series seven of Doctor Who, where they were making big myth-making statements about the character without actually analyzing the characters. And so that was kind of, that rubbed me the wrong way in a lot of series two of Sherlock, outside of the premiere. And I thought series three consistently through all three episodes did a really good job paying off on two years of watching these characters paying off on our thoughts of you know after two years away where would Sherlock and Watson be how would Sherlock have evolved having been away for two years pretending to be dead and then coming back and seeing how much he hurt his best friend how hurt would Watson be after going through all that and these specific versions and so I thought these characters this season very much matured into full three-dimensional versions of these characters. They are not necessarily 100% or even 50% the Arthur Conan Doyle versions of these characters, yeah, yeah. but they have become who they are on this TV show so compellingly to me, and I think the arcs the two characters take over the course of these three episodes um, was remarkably satisfying. Like, I think better than either of the previous two series, this had cumulative impact. Series, episode 2 built off episode 1 Episode 3 built off episodes 1 and 2 And those relationships And where those characters were going um, Especially now we have Watson's wife on the show Mary Morstan Played by Martin Freeman's actual wife And I thought she was a really good addition And helped move those characters along uh, And I thought you know none of the mysteries this year Were quite as interesting as the one in In Study in Pink In um, the, the big game or whatever it's called The, the season one finale I yeah, forget what it's called I think it's the big game Yeah something like that I don't, Or in, in the Irene Adler episode So the plot wasn't as interesting It never was really problematic for me I think the third episode Was paced really strangely to me But not in a bad way necessarily And I thought the second episode was Again walked this really fine line Between going into full blown parody comedy And keeping it serious In the ways of character and plot and I thought it did it marvelously. That is my favorite episode of this season, was the second one, the, the wedding episode. I thought structurally it was fascinating. Um, I thought they did a really good job with that structure, building the mystery into the structure, the mystery slowly revealing itself over the course of that, and also being like this kind of victory lap where they were paying off on these character arcs and, and letting these characters evolve over the course of that episode, and really feeling like the Sherlock and Watson in that episode, in this season, these are not the people we met in episode one. And that sense of accumulation really made series three click for me in ways series two overall did not and honestly to degrees where i was more satisfied and had more fun and was more invested watching these three episodes than i think i was back at the start with sherlock series one so that's what i would say about these in broad strokes okay right so let you rebut all right so for me to, to go back to what i was saying when i was introducing my perspective on sherlock like i said you know some sort of like pits again terrible fucking moriarty so bad but overall, really, really, really liking Sherlock throughout all of Series 1 and 2. Then coming into Series 3, very excited. Like, so excited, like I said, that I rewatched both of those series in preparation for th Series 3 coming on. And overall, I don't particularly dislike this series, but I think it's, it's easily my least favorite of the two. And I'm overall... Of the three. Of, yeah, of the three. The two good ones. No, it's not. This one's not that bad. But I'm, like, mostly just kind of lukewarm on it. And one of the major things is that it did not deliver... Anything that I was looking for, I suppose. Because, again, I'm a huge fan of murder mystery stories. Like, that's why, you know, I've watched so much fucking Law & Order. I have no idea how much fucking Law & Order I've watched. Uh, th like, that's what attracted me to all the Sherlock Holmes stories in the first place. I was looking for something like that to experience. And it's some of the best type of that fiction that has ever been written. It's, like, basically some of the first of that fiction that has ever been written. And so, that's what I come to it for. Like, that's what it is. It is... Crime fiction to me is detective fiction at some of its finest, and that's why I want to experience these stories. That's what I why I want. That's how these characters are just are constructed is to function in that kind of story, in my opinion. And so then coming into series three and discovering that series three, like the first episode of series three, there's effectively no mystery. There is, 
but is so uninteresting, so undeveloped, so just dumb and useless by the time that you get to the episode, at the end of the episode, it's completely unsatisfying to me because all it was was character development. And that's fine. Like, I love their Watson. I love their Holmes. And I especially think the beginning of that episode, well, like, the beginning part of where once Holmes and Watson are sort of interacting with one another, I think that those sections are really well done, mostly because Martin Freeman is so fucking good as that Watson. And I think it is a much more honest reaction because in the empty house story the like the one it's actually based on when Holmes shows up Watson's like Holmes holy shit I thought you were dead for years now like I'm married I have my practice and holy shit you just come out of nowhere like let's hook up bro like let's get back on that detective shit and it's like and it's really charming and like it's and it's very like that Watson because it's, so, it's very true to that yeah Watson. it's because it's such a sort of like Victorian response to that right. and and that's actually the first in the Granada television series that's the first episode where Edward Hardwick plays Watson so I'm I'm especially fond of that story because that adaptation is so good of just a direct adaptation of The Empty House so like that section I thought was a really well done version of like reimagining that scene and like how those characters would actually behave if they met each other again especially these versions of those characters that Watson is fucking pissed and oh my god should Watson be so fucking pissed at it it's again, Martin Freeman is impeccable throughout throughout the entire series and like most stuff he does. But uh, yeah, so that like the character development stuff is I think is well done and it's well done throughout all of the episodes. But it's it's what is the like the, all the episodes are about the character development. With the third episode having the most being the most like the the previous two series in terms of like trying to balance some sort of like plot and character at the same time definitely you know episodes one and three are more like those Doyle stories where Sherlock is not hired for do, you know executing a mystery yeah. but just getting something done and there are a couple of Doyle stories like there are, that there are, yeah there are a few and the one that episode three is based on is kind of one of those but that one's yeah. also I don't know it has it because it's like just because it's not a mystery it's like it's still a plot like it's yeah. just like it's not a traditional someone comes into 221B sits down and tells home some like weird story about some right. like they got kidnapped and had to interpret Greek for some motherfucker and it's yeah. like what the fuck is this shit you know but yeah so that's so like the, while the character development th- stuff I thought was really well done I don't think it was ever well done enough to carry everything because I don't think that's the nature of the characters it's not what I'm expecting it's not what I want it's not what I sort of think is kind of implicit in making a Sherlock Holmes story and it's sort of like and, and it's also sort of problematic to me because in a show that didn't only have you know three 90 minute episodes every couple of years in a show that had, you know, like a 12 or 24 episode season of like 30 or 45 minute episodes, then episodes like this or stories like this would be totally fine, where it's like it's mostly character development and in that sense feels kind of like fluff in the sense that it doesn't have any real plot development at all. It's all about the characters. That can be really enjoyable, like, you know, like that's basically 90% of anime and I fucking love anime in general. That's the kind of storytelling they generally lean to. But in that format... It works for me because it's like you also have a plot developing at the same time. And so you can kind of take a break from the plot and then focus on the character development and have a kind of sort of balance in that sense. And this season, I think, when you only have three episodes, it's like by the time I finished that third episode of, of that season, it was like I, like, I feel like I'm forgetting about the episodes already because they were all just character development. and None of them had sort of a mystery element. None of them had a real plot element to them that I felt was compelling. And I, and I see where you're coming from, and I think this is just a matter of taste and perspective, because I think back on these, and honestly, the, some of the memories that stick out in my mind most from all three seasons of Sherlock, a lot of them come from these three episodes. Like, my favorite Cumberbatch acting is in this season, because I think some of the stuff he does coming back and feeling isolated and trying to rehabilitate himself as a friend, learning to be a friend, learning to be a better person, becoming to me, in a lot of ways, a little more like the Doyle Holmes, who is warmer yeah, and he's, can be yeah, more he's affectionate. All, he becomes a, less, a lot less sort of arrogant and self-aggrandizing. Yeah. And, that was, and that, was hugely, that was hugely satisfying to me. And I think Watson going through... I mean, Watson clearly has PTSD this season. Yeah. Like, and you know he kind of had that from the war, but they never really focused on it. He has, I think, the war stuff still in him. He has now his, the loss of his friend, watching his friend dive off a building and go yeah. splat. All of Growing this. Growing a mustache. Yeah, which was really bad. And so I remember all that. I remember a lot of comic interactions. And I, you know, there are just some, like, the second episode builds to 
the scene where Sherlock figures out Mary is pregnant, but then they're all dancing and they're happy. And, and then he and pulls then, a John Pertwee at the end of yeah. the Green Death and then leaves. Which Mark Gatiss the said was an homage yeah. to Doctor Who. Uh, he said that on Twitter, which I think is cool. Yeah, but anyway, it is, it is so that scene. Except for Holmes didn't get into a bright yellow car named Bessie when he drove off. Like, well, he they, really should have. They haven't established Bessie on this show yet. Maybe he'll get a <laughs> that car. That would be next so season. fucking funny if they just pulled Bessie out and had him get in and drive. Like the around. valet pulled yeah. Bessie up for him. That'd be great. But no, I, I think that, that would have was... made this. That would have made this the best season, bar none. <laughs> I'm, no. I'm happy that like that was an intentional homage and not just like something that was like this is weirdly like super specifically and like the, how it is shot. Even that scene from the end of the Green Death. Yeah, That's no, nice. it's but yeah, no, it was it was a specific homage. But that entire just closing to an episode that really was very heartwarming and funny and dynamic in a lot of ways to me uh there's just again there's a lot of memories of this season that are burned into me because i think the character side of it is so well done but they did make a specific choice this year where character was number one the plots were in service of the character um and that's not to say there wasn't plot to these that second episode is densely plotted in terms of the structure and what they're going it's it's like the the mystery is not complex necessarily but there's a lot of story it's not, to get to that and point. It's, but it's also not like at the forefront in any ways like no. it does develop but it's like it develops so much in the background and it's so subservient to what they're actually trying to do with Holmes's you know best man speech which is to sort of like develop the characters and right. tell these stories that it's like there's no i don't like you know there's always whenever you're writing fiction there you have to walk a very tight line between how you're developing the plot and how you're developing the characters and I think they went what is in a genre and a style for like characters that historically has always been immensely plot heavy and the characters have always served the plot like that's how mysteries are constructed this one is so it is all the characters and the plot is so completely subservient that it might as well not be there in most instances like it's so forgettable to me that it's like ever all the focus is so clearly on the characters, and it's most evident in episode one, that it's like that plot is so paper thin, is so useless, that they don't even bother giving it any like significant, like substantial conclusion. And they just cut away from the conclusion to go show a stupid fucking scene that makes no sense, and it's just somewhere suspended in time and space. Right. Which, which both. We'll get to that. We'll yeah, get both to that. the first episode and the third episode, I think, make these really weird choices in where they cut and move in time. Yes. And, like, that just kills the pacing. Well, we'll talk about that. Yeah. But, yeah, so, so I think that's where we're coming from. Uh, also, we'll go into more depth later. The very, very end of the season is well, fucking stupid. We will get to that. Yeah. I, I didn't There's wanna... a There is an east wind coming, Jonathan. Yes, I. <sighs> Series three would be my favorite if I would be I would be prepared to say that if it weren't for the final scene of series three. I will say that. Yeah. I hate I was so mad at the cliffhanger they did this year. I I almost threw something at my TV. Well you know what they say. There's an east wind coming. Yeah, I, I know they say that. They say yeah. it quite a few times. It's stupid. <laughs> that east wind is stupid. Anyway, uh, but yeah. You know, apparently, I think we're going to have another war with Germany. I think that's what they're implying because that's what how what it was implying originally because it was in you know like anticipation of World War One, which was brewing, and then it was used again in one of the Basil Rathbone films. Then talking about World War Two. So now clearly, <laughs> since they're using it here, we have to go to or England has to go to war with Germany. Like that's I think it's a contract, yeah. right? So can I say one more thing about the plot side of this? Sure. And this is not me disagreeing with you. Okay. Because I think a lot of what you're saying you disagreed is... with me, like, let's be honest here, you just be wrong. No, I, I think a lot of what you're saying is valid, and I understand the complaint. Another element of where I'm coming from on this is that I think Sherlock, the first two seasons, had episodes that had really interesting plots, but I never thought the plotting was the most extraordinary thing about this show at all. I think uh, the, the, the premiere episode, A Study in, in Pink has an interesting mystery, but I also think that's fairly in the background to setting up these characters and their way in and a, their methods. In a way. Like, I, think, I think it... it be, I think the part of the thing is there's, like... It doesn't even necessarily matter in some instances how actually intricate or interesting the plot is. Like, a, a huge part of it is that the plot still has to be the thing that has the focus. Like, even if literally there's more screen time, to, like, much more screen time for character development, if the focus of the episode is the plot, that's what it needs to be. In those episodes, all the focus of the episode was the mystery. Like, even if, like, and I agree with you, the first episode, Study in Pink, is, like, most of the screen time is wholly spent developing those characters which it should be because it's the first episode the focus in the lens through which they're developing the characters is always squarely focused on 
this is what this mystery is, like who killed this woman, and Sherlock trying to figure that out, and then developing the characters as they do so. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I just, and I see where you're coming from on that too. I just don't, it was never the most extraordinary thing to me on this show, and it was often something where I thought, stretching the plots they had over 90 minutes in most of the episodes, every episode of Sherlock up to series three felt overlong to me, except the season one finale and the season two premiere, which click along at exactly the pace they need to, and those to me are kind of the, the height of the series in this plot, character, everything coming together pace perfectly to me. Um, See, I actually disagree with you that I feel like... I mean, I think the, the, the number two episodes for both of those seasons feel a little long for me, for The Hound of Bastion Bills and the other one, the forgettable yeah. one. But I think both of those feel a little overlong to me, but in general, like I think the 90-minute format is really good for the show because I think it allows them to, one, have the, the character development they need because they have such strong actors and such great interpretations of the characters while also having enough time to build the mystery. So I think, I think the 90 minutes... Like, it could be used better, but I think, like, it's much better than having it be the 45-minute show. Well, and see, this Series 3 was the first season where I felt consistently all three episodes were using that time to do things dynamically. It's the funny part where I feel like all three of these episodes feel too long to me. Like, okay. I lost interest in all of them. Interesting. So, and that's not to say, I, I still think virtually every Sherlock episode could stand to have scenes trimmed down down and and like I feel like they often feel like an earlier editing pass than you would get if they they had to cut it down for time a little more yeah um, but it, it still within the constrictions within these exist um, these three felt more solid to me but in any case why don't we go through episode by episode and talk about these a little yeah. bit more so the first one uh, which was called the, the empty, empty hearse which they never really did anything with uh, yeah. but yeah we'll go with this this there is, is no dude named Colonel Sebastian Moran that used a fucking air rifle. I was so disappointed that he didn't, there was no pneumatic rifle in this whole episode. Yeah, The Empty House, if you have not read it, is a spectacular it's so fucking good. It's short story. It's yeah. really good. Uh, and they actually, the actual Empty House like quotations they do come in episode three. Yeah, yeah. yeah which is funny. But anyway, uh, so this episode, a um, lot of great, we already talked about you know, a lot of great stuff with Sherlock coming back, with Watson's reaction, all that side of it. Mustaches galore. Yeah. That side of it is great. Yeah. And I also think the introduction to the Mary character, I really like her as a yeah, character. She's, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, because it, it's always interesting to me whenever you adapt Sherlock Holmes to see what people hone in on. Because it's like, if you're not adapting the stories, like, it's so hard to, like, adapt the characters. And so, like, everyone focuses on, like, oh, this is Sherlock Holmes who's a fucking drug addict. Where it's like, now we're going to focus on John's, Watson's wife. Even though it's like... His Watson, wife is not yeah, a character. Watson gets married. Like, I... I'm not even sure if his wife ever actually physically appears in the stories. Like, I'm not at, remember. At most, he asks her permission to leave. Yeah, it's something yes. like that. Yeah, it's just like she never is involved. So it's always, always love that it's like someone else adapts Sherlock Holmes and it's like, this is this version of the character. Yeah. Well, I did think they definitely took that opportunity to build a character from scratch and they ran with it. Yeah. And you see yeah. how, you see right from the beginning how she is the right match for John Watson, especially at this point in his life. Yeah. And the chemistry is so good. And not just with Freeman, but with Cumberbatch. Yeah. So now you have this kind of three-person unit there that works very well. And the opportunity for a lot of gay jokes, which they, they availed there of were, themselves liberally this season. Yeah. They, there were too many. Um, there have always been too many gay jokes on Sherlock. I thought they went overboard in The Empty Hearse uh, with yeah. those. But there weren't any in two or three, I don't think. There was, there was, yes, there must have been. Like, I don't remember what they specifically were, but I'm sure there was at least one. <laughs> I, think it's, it's, I think it's in the contract that it's like, yeah. you have to have at least one Someone, Watson and Holmes are gay again, jokes. Again, Alan Seppenwall and Dan Feinberg on their TV podcast, they were reviewing Series 3 of Sherlock recently. And, and they noted that it's kind of funny, Elementary, the CBS Sherlock show, has Watson as a woman, and they say it has significantly less um, sexual tension between the characters <laughs> than Holmes and Watson on Sherlock. I mean, it and is, I believe that. I mean, yeah, and I guess to be fair to the writers of Sherlock, that it would, it's hard, it must be hard to resist writing the gay jokes, because Martin Freeman and Benedict Cumberbatch weirdly do have some sexual chemistry they, on screen. Like, there is a little, there's a spark there. Like, if they kissed... You would not be that surprised that it happened, honestly. No, probably not. So it, it's you know it's a tricky it's a tricky situation to be in. It's yeah. a sticky situation, some might call it. But. Yeah. But anyway, we also touched upon the plot of the empty hearse, which is basically there's this terrorist attack in London. Uh, Sherlock has to solve. I forgot. There's a the Sherlock has to solve it, and and again, part of they they even make a joke about this at the end. The mystery is so easy for Sherlock to solve. He's really just using it as an excuse the to get that episode is so ridiculous. They're just like. Like, they're just like, yeah, there was no plot here. Like, 
there's no there's no need to have like we just manufactured urgency. Like there's obviously no reason for anybody stressed out in this situation. Let's just go home. It's like let's just you know we had all this like tension we were trying to build up. Let's, fuck it. Like who cares? Let's not try to satisfactorily re- resolve the episode. Let's not you know have a decent climax and then you know falling action. Fuck it. Let's just stop. Let's just go home. Let's just you know put it. Let's press the red button that kills all the tension and end the episode. It's like okay, sure. We don't need to write a fucking story. I will say, you know, we get to that scene where they're they're on the the bus or the the, the subway yeah, subway train, yeah. and they're trying to defuse the bomb and they don't know how. And it is a stupendous scene yes. in terms of how good Cumberbatch and Freeman are playing off each other and the confessions they're making and everything. And what I and you know, there's this moment at the end right before they cut to that weird scene where <laughs> where Watson <laughs> kind of <laughs> so it's it's weird, but God. Watson clenches up and that's when it cuts. And I was sure. And it would have been so satisfying if Watson had figured out how to do it. Which is how it should have been. I I was going to say the exact same thing. Because everything in that scene is building up to that moment where Watson figures it out and saves the day. And that would have been the perfect resolution. It would have been. And and I'm I'm disappointed they didn't do that. Um, The end of the episode is structurally very strange. But yeah. Um, But then the, the, the other side of this episode we haven't talked about yet is, of course, answering the mystery of how Sherlock... Lived and you mean trolling all the the fans of the show on the internet? Now, see that a lot of, of a lot of people have made a bigger deal out of this than I thought the episode did. But I, I mean, the, the fact two... that the episode went over it twice, I think, is what makes it a big deal. Like the because the way the episode opens is it opens with like replaying that scene, and you think, oh, this are is we the answer, seeing? Yeah. yeah, is there are we seeing the answer? But then, like, it seems like kind of a weird answer, and then you find out that it's just Lestrade talking to. Although I will people. say. The first one they give us to me is infinitely more plausible than the yeah. actual one at yeah. the end. But yeah, Lestrade's just telling it to, to the coroner dude, and then you're like, oh, okay, I guess that's kind of a clever way to open it, kind of like pulling the rug out from under your feet, because a big thing, like, Sherlock has a huge fan community online, mostly because people like writing slash fake about Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman, like, or Benedict Cumberbatch and then dude, Moriarty. Dude, yeah, the dude who plays the awful Moriarty. Andrew Scott. Okay, sure. Let's the Sadly, dude who he plays the awful Moriarty. No, yeah. he doesn't. He doesn't deserve it. He ruined a fantastic character. But yeah, so people they it has that it has that kind of super disgusting internet fan community that it's like I I approached cautiously at the end of season two to just see it's like I wonder like what people think like if anyone has some interesting idea about this cliffhanger and how it might resolve and it's like Nope! Nobody has any everyone just has a stupid fucking idea about it and then it's like, okay, like yeah, I'm not touching this community with a ten and a half foot pole for the rest of my life. And so it has that kind of fan community. And so they're clearly, like, obviously poking fun but, at it. Right, like, yeah. if, you, if you expose yourself to that side of the community at all... And there were several instances in this whole season where I felt like... the Like, Stephen Moffat and Mark Gatiss were very clearly conscious of that kind of fandom that they have. And they were kind of poking fun at it and trying to appeal to it in weird ways at the same time. But this season was the most or that episode was the most clear of it where it's like you know they do that at the beginning and then when you get to the conclusion Martin Freeman clenches up and you're like you're really tense because I agree with you that scene is really spectacular it's building up to what seems like it should be a really great conclusion that would be a like a fantastic conclusion to an episode that's so focused on character development by like having you know Martin Freeman be able to Watson be able to resolve the situation and then instead it like flashes white and then it goes in and it's goes in and it's another explanation where it's Sherlock I think is telling the coroner dude what the explanation yeah. is and it's gibberish I just yeah. want to say this this is the one they present as being plausible it in no way adds up to what we saw at the end of season 2 nothing in it yeah. nothing in it adds up the placement of that building that supposedly would block it is not there in season 2 yeah. it's complete and utter bullshit and it's such bullshit that I do prefer the one at the beginning where it's kind of silly in that kind of that Errol Morris way where he like grabs Molly and kisses her and whatnot. Yeah. But it works. It's it's overall it like it's plausible with what we saw mostly. Uh, the one at the end of the episode is not. Is the one at the because I didn't remember it specifically. Is the one at the end is that the one where it's almost like it's a literally a movie set and yes. like they're like moving everything uh-huh. around. Yeah, like I find it That's completely implausible, but I do conceptually I kind of like the explanation in a weird meta way in terms of like it was weird watching it on screen because it's literally like you're watching them with a film set. It's like you're like behind the camera almost. Yeah. In like a weird not in a good way, but in an interesting way. 
Well, and, and I also don't like that explanation because it draw it saps any existing tension out of the series two finale yeah. because it reveals that Sherlock was in charge the whole time. There was never any threat, and he had the whole thing under control all the time. Yeah, which is impossible. which is a problem that Sherlock kind of encountered, where they 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 made Sherlock a bit too powerful in some senses, where he you kind of get that sense in a few instances. Yeah. But that yeah, I agree with you that. And actually, I was thinking back to there. There, there's another scene, isn't there, where they there's get an explanation a short, because there's, there's a, this, there's the it's not gift, an explanation, but well, there's the gift that set the internet ablaze, which is Benedict Cumberbatch yeah. and Andrew Scott almost it, and the horrible it's, Moriarty. It's like two minutes again. If you understand that fan community, that is such a deliberate. I know, yeah, poke in their eye that it's like, but yeah, this is a. It's way too self conscious, and it takes. It, at least it took me completely out of the episode when it happened. I didn't think it was too self conscious because Sherlock has always had that dialogue with its fan community. And but not like that. Like not in the that's the, that's so, like completely like it was entire, so it was like when on Doctor Who you say Doctor Who. It was like that. Like it gave I, me that no. same like you know, like my testicles went up to my stomach. I'm just like, what do you ah! I didn't think that at all because there's so much in the series two about Sherlock getting famous and all the the idea of, of him becoming this tabloid sensation and all this stuff. But that and, feels that in some way feels germane to the story to me because he actually would become really famous. And I think if that happens, then this is germane to the story also. That would, no, it's, if there was it's someone just like, the ridiculous. Like Sherlock has this like weird. It's like it's like Love and Monsters of Doctor Who, where the Doctor has a fan community. It's like that. Like that doesn't feel appropriate to like the setting and the style at but all. That's it how, feels completely ridiculous. I think it's I think it's in in keeping with if you're gonna make your character a major media personality, these kind of fan communities pop up. For yeah, people but the in fan communities too. might exist, but like focusing on it, I don't think is appropriate to the atmosphere and tone of the series. Like it just feels completely bizarre to okay. me whereas Sherlock Holmes and Sherlock becoming famous and using that to tell the stories like that's totally fucking fine like yeah of course you would I again I feel like people have blown this out of proportion it's like two minutes of the finished episode of The Empty Hearse where they're poking fun at that fan community but it's it, not the whole episode it's not but um, the fact that they do it at all is wrong like they shouldn't I like don't. it shouldn't have been in the episode at all or it could have been the very opening like if it was just that that would be fine because it's kind of if it, that's it like it's kind of ambiguous as to whether or not they're doing it. But then, especially having this scene that is in the... Literally, instead of having a climax... Like, it's, you know, you have the, the typical, like, you learn in, like, grade school... The chart of the story where it's like you have introduction, rising action, climax, falling action, conclusion. It's like, you have that rising and you go to the point where that's climax... And that's cut out and then you put a dot on another piece of paper... And that's what happened to your climax, is you cut... And now you're just suspended in a scene that you have no... I don't know if that scene happened before the climax. I don't know if that scene happened after the climax. That scene might have happened like six seasons from now. For all I fucking know. Because it has no justification. No context whatsoever. It's utterly bizarre. And then like, you know, Sherlock's giving this ridiculous explanation. And then he's like, no, this... He basically says like, that did not fucking happen. And then the coroner dude just goes crazy and starts ripping shit off the walls. It's like... No, I don't like that scene. What either. is this scene? It's it, it's like, and then you cut back, and then you find out that Sherlock just solved the problem on his own and had to solve the problem forever ago and whatever. Like he just pressed a button or whatever. It's just the literally one of the worst climaxes to any story I've ever seen. It's such a misunderstanding of storytelling as an art. That's just like, what are you doing? Like you're just who put that scene there? Kill your editor. Like who did this? Who wrote this? Like how did you? fucking do that. It's astounding to me. Mark Gatiss wrote it. Don't take a fucking creative writing class. Just like, read a fucking book. Because that's not it's not how you construct a story. It's complete fucking nonsense. Alright, it did not bother me that much. It's, I don't like that I, It scene, offends though. me personally because I'm, I'm fascinated with storytelling as an art form. So it's like, you just pissing all over it with this disgusting this, just this stupid fucking waste of an episode that was building up to something satisfying. Like, that's what makes it really saddening to me, in a way, is that it's like, you had a good moment here. Like, you had constructed something that I found really interesting, and you just shat on it for no reason. But then to make, like, book fun of your fucking fan community, you're like, fuck them. Why do you even care? Like, don't address it at all. I will say, you know, I think... I can see seeds of how this structure, where they have that cut, could have worked. Because when you start that cut, it's at, you know, Watson and and Holmes are at their lowest. And you cut, and it's Sherlock narrating in a very dramatic voice how he lived. And I could see if you put there the actual explanation, and you did it seriously, and it made sense and everything. And then came back, and that's when Watson... If you had done it intelligently and artfully and found some way to make it carry the tension, yes. 
They, they did not. No, they did that. not. They, they did not in any way do I'm that. I'm not arguing with you. Yeah. I, I'm just saying it's. I can see where the seed of an idea God. came from, and I think it probably got mutilated over the course of the process. It got, and, like Mark Gatiss went on Tumblr, and that just destroyed everything. He went on Sherlock Tumblr, and it's like, oh, I should just create a parody character of you know our fans. It's like, okay, we'll turn a character we already had into a parody character of their fans. Anyway, so anything God, else to so. Uh, other things I want to say on the empty hearse, just on a more positive note, yeah, sure. is it wasn't just Watson and Sherlock and Mary. I thought they did really good work with this season. They also have that Molly Hooper character they've always had in the background. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I really liked, liked a lot of stuff with her here because it helped. I think it was in this episode where Sherlock is very honest with her and says, "I do care about you." Yeah. Um, in a way that I, it's not in a romantic way, but it's in a way I believe this Sherlock Holmes would do, where sure, he, yeah. he does value her as a person. And I thought that was a good payoff on a couple years of, of having that character around and. Um, and just overall, again, that kind of arc for Sherlock, starting in this episode of, of humanizing and making him a warmer character, uh, worked very well. Yeah. And it is sadly undercut by him doing another bit of psychological torment on Watson at the end of the episode. Yeah. So, in any case. Yeah. That's that one. Yeah. Offensive to my sensibilities, but other than that, the rest of it was actually kind of okay. Okay. So let's move on. We have, the second episode is called The Sign of Four. The sign of three. Yes. The, the book is it's the sign, of, the sign four. of four. Yeah. This is the sign of three. If they had had twins, then it would have been the sign. Of four. I can never remember Sherlock episode titles because they take titles. Yeah, because they, I know. Yeah, they're making parodies. Yeah. Except for the Hound of the Hound of Baskervilles, which is just Hound of the Baskervilles. I think it's the Hounds of Baskerville on oh. Sherlock, and it's the Hound of the Baskervilles oh. in the book. That's so. clever. Yeah, they've really tried hard on that one. Yes. So anyway, Except they called the Hound of Baskertown. And I think I originally saw it spelled as, and the final episode did not do this, but it was Hounds with H O U N D S as an acronym, which would have just like given away the episode because that's right. like the thing that happens at the end. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that would have been funny. <laughs> but yeah, so second episode, sign of three. This is the wedding episode. Sherlock has to give a best man speech for Watson. This is the most overtly comedic episode they've yeah. ever done. But it, you know, the thing that the first thing I want to say about this episode is that. Before I sound like a hypocrite, is that I really, really hate the the Robert Downey Jr. movie Sherlock Holmes: A Game of Shadows because it is so comedic and is such a parody of Sherlock Holmes that it is kind of offensive to me. Um, like they have the whole scene where you know Sherlock gets on a pony and doesn't know how to ride it and falls off in the mud. It's like yeah, fuck you yeah. guys. The whole movie is a comedy and it's a very bad comedy and they're constantly just making fun of the characters. And the line, and, and obviously a lot of this season and the sign of three in particular is very comedic too. But the difference for me here is that on Sherlock, on the, the BBC series, it's a much warmer comedy. It's never coming from hating or belittling the characters. Yeah. It's it's only coming from our pre-existing affection and understanding of them, and kind of warping that. And I think there are points, moments where they almost go too far, but they always bring it back to seriousness, like. Ultimately, what does his best man speech climax in is this very heartfelt, very moving ode to Watson. Yeah, and then it says Sherlock ejaculated. It's right, yes. Yeah, if you read the script, that's sure. what it said. Yeah. Yes. But no, it's, it's, it's very down to earth, and it comes back to, honestly, him saying the kinds of things about Watson, Holmes would say about Watson in the Doyle stories. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And I really liked that. So it's always working in service of, of character in a dramatic way, but we can have the comedy... Um, and it's a good balance, I yeah. thought. I mean, I think probably like episode two is the best of the season. And it, especially it's like the least offensive to me because I don't think it makes any critical mistakes in how it constructs its story. It's just like, like you said, it's, it's so comedic and there's like really no mystery. Like there is a mystery technically, but it's like so in the background like that it doesn't I even would... occur to him that there is a mystery until like the last 15 minutes or 20 minutes. It's about the last 30 minutes, but we're going through and we see all these. This is kind of fun because I think this was an episode where they got to kind of have their cake and eat it too, where they were able to do a bunch of little like mini mysteries and have it, we were seeing more of their day-to-day -day life as you would see in the Doyle stories. Yeah. And I liked those windows into that, like these kind of flashback structure. Um, building to Sherlock making his points about Watson uh, over the course of the speech. I think it's actually a very smart structure. And then we get into Holmes is like talking to all these people online, and that's where he realizes this mystery is coming out right. of. Yeah. And, and then the last half hour of the episode or so is him interviewing the guests at the wedding, and it becomes more heavily mystery-focused then. But I, I think structurally it's very interesting. I think it's, it's actually something that could fall apart so easily. It kind of amazes me that it works and they pull the structure off. Um, I think it's got a lot of great character beats in it. Um, 
you know, I, I think it's very touching and I think ultimately building to the end they build to where they can all be happy and have forgiven, you know, Watson and Holmes can forgive each other and can really have reached this point of total mutual respect where they can say it about each other, but then Sherlock ultimately realizes how isolated he is in the John Pertwee way. Yeah, then he gets in his yes. bright yellow car and drives away, and yeah. then he meets Sarah Jane. Yeah. It, it all works very well um, for me. So so I like this one. Um, I don't know what else there's to say about it without going in much deeper on it. So Yeah, like, I will say... I think it had the best and like most effective and subtle joke that the show has ever done which is it's in the scene like the sequence of events where Holmes and Watson are drunk together then Holmes is trying to make a deduction and it does a thing where it's like shows <laughs> that's, a text that's a and he's like looking at like like someone's tie or something it just says thingy with like a question mark that was a really good joke that's a good joke I liked the elephant in the room joke. Yeah, that was good. I just I love that. That's something we'll never see. Yeah, was the mystery of the elephant in the room. Yeah, that was good. So things like that. I thought it was a very fun and character satisfying episode. Felt like a big celebration for these characters. And yeah, and, and again, then, like I think I would have really liked the episode if this show was structured differently. If this was like an episode that was like within a season that had the other aspects of the show that I enjoy, instead of it just being like. It is so, like, out of the three, this one is, like, all character development as far as I'm concerned. Like, there is a mystery, but, like, the mystery's not particularly interesting or compelling to me in any way. Like, the solution to it of, like, who's going to die is so, so immediately telegraphed at the beginning of the episode of who they focus on. It's like, of course, it's yeah. this character. It's like... It felt in its yeah. scale and in the specific solution, like the kind of thing Doyle would write. That kind of thing where they have the, the sword, he's already dead. Yeah. By the time he's put on the belt, that's a very Doyle kind of like solution to the story, where yeah. it's, it was in plain sight, and the way they figure it out, it's it's this kind of high tech um, crime. I yeah. thought that was interesting. But, but you know, the Doyle stories are like thirty page short stories. They are, and, and that's minute. and that's part yeah. of that's something that I thought they captured at, at various times a little better in this season was some of that atmosphere um, of some of the Doyle kind of storytelling. Um, but it's something that you basically can't capture in a ninety minutes. Yeah, it's like it's, it's it's such a completely different format that it's like you can't. And that's, they're just different stories. That's like, part of why you're doing one of the novellas. Yeah, and that's part of why I like Sign of Three. You get a little more of that. But in any case, let's move on. But to, then it has you know it has the John Pertwee moment at the end. So yeah. that's that's fantastic. So let's move on. His last vow, uh, which obviously builds off the the vow he makes in the episode. I will say this is one of those those great episodes, the the Sign of Three, where I have to wonder it's, it's like oh, there's a lot of TV shows that do this kind of thing but it's Sherlock makes that wedding so much about him and his character development and stuff you have to wonder what the other guests are thinking yeah like uh, half the guests don't cannot know who Sherlock Holmes yeah, is yeah yeah most of them so it's, it's, it's like Mrs. Hudson Lestrade and yeah. like the other police detective woman there so like That's it. that vow he makes at the end is really touching to us to Watson and to Mary and maybe to Molly and some of the other people there but most of the people would be like get off the fucking stage dude yeah. you, you're not getting married asshole right Mr. House, like, who are you? <laughs> anyway, so his last vow, this is where we meet Charles Augustus Magnuson, based you know, on... Jonathan, I think there's an east wind coming. <laughs> based on Charles Augustus Milverton from the story, uh, which is not his last vow. It's a different story. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. His last vow is the one where the east wind coming line is from. Okay, that's, yeah, that's what I thought. I think that one's like a spy story, too, and it's not that good. One thing I want to say. First thing I want to say... You want to say that there's, a, there's an east wind coming? First, I think there is. First thing I want to say about his last vow, which overall is I very much like as an episode... Um, uh, Magnuson is so far and away the best villain the show's <laughs> yeah, ever yeah, had. Yeah. He puts Moriarty to such shame, it makes me retroactively hate Moriarty more. Yeah, I agree. That it's like seeing this, like, you could have had a great villain the whole time, and you made us sit through, like, the end of the first season and all the second season with this shitty Moriarty, and even this season, where they somehow managed to bring him back with, like, Sherlock's yeah. fucking head. Yeah, so. I really, I really like yeah. Magnuson. Lars Mikkelsen is great in the part. It's, you know, it's, it's a good example of the character on the page. We don't necessarily see or learn a ton about him, but Lars Mikkelsen is good enough that you don't need to. You yeah. get the feeling you need to get from this guy, just in those individual scenes. Yeah, and he's, you know, he's intensely intimidating without, like, ever having to, like, do anything. He doesn't, like, kill hundreds of people. He just has, like, a very intimidating presence. And a very intellectual presence, which is something that Moriarty completely lacked. You know who would have been a great Moriarty? Who? Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah. Well, it just makes me sad to yeah. say it again, but... Yeah. If I can celebrate Hoffman's life and make fun of Moriarty on Sherlock at the same time, yeah. I feel like I've done the job of this podcast. Yeah, I think so too. Anyway, uh, his last vow overall, this might have been... 
I don't know. Empty Hearse has such a problematic ending. There yeah, are things. There are things in his last vow that bother me around the middle. I think it's paced yeah. strangely, me and too. again, not necessarily badly because all the material is good. But we go for this first half hour or so, and it's actually, I think, a, a fairly compelling mystery with with Magnuson because you just want to know how is Sherlock going to get up on this guy? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so it's very compelling. You have an absolutely fantastic joke, actually sourced from Doyle, where um, Sherlock. Fake proposes to someone to get into right, Magnuson's yeah. office. Yeah. And I did not remember that that was from the Doyle stories. And I think it's hilarious that that yeah. is something he wrote. But anyway, yeah. So the great... It um, would have been less disturbing, I think, at the time. Than, like, his, when it's presented here, you're like, Oh my god, like, this. that's, like, the most awful thing. Like, I know. manipulative, disgusting. And in a way... It almost feels like a weird step for them to take because they had done so much to humanize and sort of like normalize Sherlock in some ways of making him not this completely arrogant, like, you know, self-centered asshole. And then all of a sudden he does the most awful thing he's ever done in this whole series to this woman. He fucking has a relationship with her for like months and then proposes to her just to get into an office. It's, It's fucked up. And I think... And then at the end, he slits her throat. You, that's the part you don't see. Yeah. But it also, it's, it's a good moment because up till then I was wondering, I was thinking, they've gone way too far by giving Sherlock a girlfriend. That does not yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. Like, there was obviously something going right. on, but it's like, I wonder what he's doing. This is also the episode where we open with Sherlock in a crack den. <laughs> yeah, which is, that's another, like, because that's from one of the stories. It's in Opium Dim in the stories, yeah. but I always thought that was one of the best openings because Watson has no idea what the fuck Holmes is doing because he's not part of that case at all. He's just, like, yeah. goes into an Opium Dim trying because it's the same scenario. He goes into an Opium Dim to try to find someone else, and it's like, Holmes, what the fuck are you? Like, this is, you know, as of, opposed to the beginning of, of the... Of the empty hearse and the empty house, where they have the opposite reaction. Ho- or Watson has the same reaction in both the stories of like, what the fuck are you? Do- You're in an opium house? What the fucking shit, dude? I I leave Baker Street for a fucking week and you become an opium addict? Like, what the shit? Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a great scene in, in both the books and here. It, it is a great scene, and we also meet the the character who's the head of the Baker Street uh, Irregulars. Yeah, and I liked we got him on Sherlock. Now he's yeah. a nice, just little side character. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so anyway, we have all that. But then the episode takes a very weird turn where Mary shows up. It's this big twist. She's in Magnuson's office. She shoots Sherlock. And then we are off on a different story for 45 Yeah, minutes. you have this, like, you know, you know how they had been, like, you know, before they had made Sherlock, like, they built him up as kind of a superhero. And, they, they, like, it was getting really ridiculous and very sort of like David Tennant, you're a Doctor Who, and, like, walk into a room and say, I'm 900 years old and I solve the problem that way. Or Sherlock Holmes just walks into a room and says everything and then it's like, it's over. And he's like, so super genius. It's, he came, became kind of unrelatable in a sense in a way that he went kind of too far. And this season, even though I didn't like a lot of the episodes, I thought the first two episodes did a good job of dialing him back and humanizing him. Like you said, to make him much more like the Conan Doyle version of the character. And then you get a scene where he gets shot and it's so self-aggrandizing of just like, they have this, like, ridiculous 30-minute, like, operatic sequence in his head of him going down these stairs and, like, talking to Mycroft in his mind of, like, no, you have to fall backwards and all this shit. It's like, and then you you know that, like, you know, Mary, like, was intentionally shooting him so he wouldn't die, so it didn't seem like he would have to go through all that trouble to do it anyways. But he needs to go through all this shit to, like... He uses the power of intelligence to yeah. save his own life. It's such a... It, it kind of felt like a scene that should be in one of the Robert Downey Jr. movies of like when he's like fight bare knuckle boxing people and it's like she slows down major times and it's like he's going to kick me in my left thigh and then I'll block him and then punch him here and then block him here and then break his leg and then you know shove my fingers up his nose and touch his brain and kill him it's like oh and then the fight plays out that way you know it's I, I want to see you write one of the Robert Downey Jr. movies with that kind of I think that was I'm pretty sure that's what happened in the movie I saw I don't know what cut you saw well anyway um, but yeah I think it's an interesting you know, to be fair, the whole Mind Palace thing comes from Caesar's Series 2. That's where they introduce yeah, that. Yeah, they do, yeah. Um, they take it further here, and I think the scene goes on too long. I like it in concept. I think in execution, it's just too big. And yeah, it's, it's too ridiculous. And it could have been, depending on the way the rest of the episode was structured, if, like, after this, Sherlock, like, recovers and comes back and is, like, you know, like, trying to get, like, vengeance or, like, something like that where he's going after Mary, I think it would have been better and made this kind of a more kind of a badass scene in a way of like she was legitimately trying to kill Sherlock but she failed because Sherlock's Superman like that would have still been I don't think a direction of what like it would have been too over the top but at least they could have like gone with how over the top it was 
But it's like it felt like they wrote that scene and then they didn't follow up on it. Like they, like the rest of the episode well, was not in that tone. You well, know? here's what I was going to say about the big diversion. I actually wasn't talking about this scene on no. its own. Yeah. Because actually, yeah, once we see Mary in the office, the next 45 minutes, become about, first we have yeah. the Mind Palace, but it's all about solving the mystery of Mary. Yeah. And there's a lot of good material in there. It just feels weird because I was so invested in the Magnuson side. Then we go to Mary, and it's okay because we get back to Magnuson. But, yeah. you know, it's but a little it is, weird. It, and the pacing there is weird. In particular... It's, it's 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 in a way it's different, but it's also sort of similar to what they do in uh, the first episode where they have that moment where Sherlock and Watson like they get Mary like into that one building to like they have like this confrontation, and then all of a sudden it cuts away to some point in time that you yeah. don't really know that's some manner of months because you know she's pregnant and it's like you don't understand their relationship and I think that it makes the same mistake where it's like they kill the tension of this moment. And place you into an era, a scene that has no context that you like. When I was watching it, I just didn't know what I was supposed to be feeling. Like I felt like I was just completely adrift. That they had not yeah. appropriately done that. Like that transition could have worked if you did it appropriately. But I think they cut at the wrong moment, and the scene that went into was not the right kind of scene to go into. And it was just like I kind of felt adrift in the episode for a long time until Magnuson came back in to recenter it. It was just like. I don't understand what Watson and Mary's relationship is in this scene at all, so I don't know if I'm supposed to, like, who I'm supposed to be kind of, like, siding with and stuff, you know? It's weird. Yeah, and and honestly, this isn't the first time I feel like the pace of Sherlock has been odd in a certain way. Yeah. Like, I, I, it's, it's always a problem for me in the Study in Pink episode where it's so much a two-hander, that episode, until suddenly Sherlock gets in the cab with the bad guy, and they, they go and have a 20... Yeah. They, they have a 25-minute conversation. It's a very long scene at the end between him and the villain, and Watson is out of that episode until the end. And when he comes back in, he's very minor. Um, and I felt kind of adrift in that episode every time I watch it too. I, like, is, I don't, know, I don't get that sense in that. I've always so, like I kind that. of I kind of see where you're going, but like I because I think of how Watson comes back in and shoots him through the window. I don't. It's think satisfying, it, yeah. but it's yeah. Anyway. I, it's, it's very different. Like I think I feel like there's a lot of kind of stuff that does this where you're trying to do something interesting with how you're cutting the move like your story and sort of like jumping in time but with like it's a very tricky thing to do and so it's like if you don't do it at the right moment in the right way i think you just kill the pacing and tension of the story until this the audience can recenter itself and it can be used like if you want to set your audience kind of adrift and uncenter them from the story that can be used really well if it's supposed to be a disorienting moment but it, this is not in any no, way. It's like, not. It doesn't and, feel germane to the story. And I will say, because of this, uh, his last vow while watching was my least favorite. Thinking about them, it's maybe rised in my uh, estimation Yeah, like, when I ways. think about back on it, like, I think it, the individual scenes are really good. And so, like, when I remember it in my memory, it's better. But yeah. then I think about how it is constructed in sequence and how I felt about while watching it. And I remember it's like, it's... I don't think as a whole it's, it functions that well. Although I will say it has the advantage to me of having a very strong climax. Like once they go to Magnuson's estate, I think that's a great set of scenes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And obviously this leads to the two big re- things that happened in the episode. Well, we already had the stuff with Mary, so more yeah. big things. But we have the revelation that the his entire you know a state of information is in his head. Magnuson has yeah. his mind palace. So I thought that was a that was a cool twist. I, I liked it too because you know while it is outside the realm of total possibility it is based in actual theories of how memory work and so it's got this kind of layer of plausibility to it that's really interesting like you know the the kind of scientific theory behind that and the fact that like the mind palace thing was set up like was a thing that Holmes used in season 2 like it felt a lot more right here in season 3 it's right here in this episode yeah Um, it it pays off on that earlier scene to a certain degree because it was setting up this yeah, so I thought that worked, and it makes Magnuson all the more terrifying and intimidating. Yeah, especially because you thought, like, his... Because they, they see the weak, like the perceived weakness of, like, he's using his glasses yeah. so early on that it's, like, it's really satisfying. It's, like, satisfying is a weird word to say, but it's, like, it's a really fascinating moment when Holmes thinks he's discovered the weakness, and you think he's discovered the weakness, because it's paced. That moment is paced like so many of these mystery stories of, like, oh, he's at the conclusion that he's figured out what the audience has already been exposed to, but then you realize it's sort of a double bluff kind of thing. I thought yes. that moment was really well done. Really good. And so then we get the flicking scene, which yeah. I really love. It's like, I can flick you as much as I want, and yeah. you can't do anything. It was kind of like a Philip Seymour Hoffman in Mission Impossible yes. the villain kind of moment. It was just like, I don't give a fuck. I'm just gonna keep do on doing this. Just fuck you, man. And so it, it forces Sherlock into the position of shooting Magnuson in the head. Yeah. What do you think about this? I think Watson should have shot him. But Watson has a wife and kid. So? 
he'd go to jail. It'd be bad. So for him he would shit. he would still do it, and you know, Mary's also you know an assassin. I don't know if Watson is established here would do that. I th- I think I think he would have. Yeah. I th- Watson is still recovering from just stuff, having you know, killed people. The... He's he's a killer man. He he could do it. He was he's an the army carried... doctor. He was not a he's, killer. He's killed people. Who he was Watson. He was in the war. Okay, I, like they definitely say earlier. He's done. He's killed okay. people within the context of the series. So you so. thought Watson should have just shot him? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I th- it, it feels weird to me having I think Sherlock Wa- kill someone. Feels like strange. A lot of people have said that it did. I thought it worked in the moment because it. I thought the season built to that. Of it was Sherlock having. It was kind of him. Sort of what's the word? Synergizing. I think the kind of two halves of his personality this season, where he became. He really was able to open himself up and accept how important people like Watson and Mary are in his life. And how this, unimportant people like Charles Magnuson are. They should all be fucking killed. That is not what I was going to say. But that's but what he you has, to say. But he also has this side where he realizes how much his own character limitations stop him from having full human interactions. You have that, you know, um, John Pertwee, Joe Grant moment at the end yeah. of season, uh, episode two. And and I think that's that's where he was headed here is that to do to fulfill one side of the personality, he also had to give in to this other side, and I liked that symbolically of putting him in a position where all of that had to be put on the table, and he had to put it all together at that one moment in this kind of horrible but necessary action. I don't see that as doing that at all of him shooting him. I don't think that I think that almost kind of in a way does the opposite. Like, but it's the it's the it's the only thing he can do there to stop Magnuson from threatening Watson. And well, it's not wife. the only thing he could have done. He's fucking Sherlock Holmes. He could have done a million things. He fucking was shot earlier in the episode and spent an hour in his head deconstructing how to survive getting shot at point blank in the chest. Like, I, it did. It felt like but Sherlock not, Holmes should have been able to figure out a way to get out of the situation, and so him I resorting guess, to guess, have to shoot someone. It feels unorganic to me, inorganic to how like that Sherlock has been. I guess I can see where you're coming from, but at the same time, we've we've established very well at this point in the episode that nobody in any position of power is going to take on Magnuson, and there's nothing he can Except do. For Watson, because Watson doesn't give a fuck. Like, like Watson, Watson shouldn't gonna... have shot him. You know how he had that tire iron when he went to the coke den? He should have like they should have revealed okay. that he put it, he kept it with him, and he beat Magnuson to death at the fucking tire. Watson iron. is Watson is not in a position of power. That's not what I was talking about. Political power. So no one in law or political power is going to take on Magnuson. There's, that's never going to happen. He's like Rupert Murdoch. This just cannot Watson happen. Has to do it. Okay, but I'm talking about Sherlock right now. Yeah. And in, in any case, uh, Sherlock. Which could is why try Sherlock to... can't do it because he's brother to the greatest official in the entire fucking British government. So like, you know, shit's going to come down on Mycroft, and shit coming down on Mycroft would be disastrous to the entire United Kingdom. He doesn't care about Mycroft like that. It's just fucking yes. I want. I want to say something about Mycroft really quick. Yeah, they yeah. did great character rehabilitation on Mycroft yeah. this season for me. I did not like their version of that character much in seasons one and two because they made him into a buffoon. Yeah. This year he was smart and could actually go toe to toe with Sherlock. Yeah. In the way Doyle wrote him. Yeah, where, they have that really great scene where they're doing the competing deductions, yeah. which is something they do in the books. Yeah. yeah. That I liked. And the whole thing, it's the same thing in the books where Mycroft could theoretically be as smart or smarter than Holmes, but he is kind of lazy and pompous. Yeah, yeah, so he's he too doesn't. lethargic, so he just, yeah. you know, stays in the Diogenes Club and just, like, yeah. directs the British government at his whim. Yeah. Well, anyway, I like this as an ending. What what bothered me about the Sherlock shooting uh, Magnuson is that I thought the, the payoff on it was not extreme enough. Like, yeah. we have, I mean, there's the big problem of them turning the plane around at the end, which is a total cop-out. Yeah. And, basically, and then also there's something about, like, us entering the season with Sherlock having been having been like this weird spy in Serbia or wherever the fuck he yeah. was, and then you ending the season like they don't actually, but like leading into you're ending the season with sending off Sherlock again, which would have just been like, well, now you're just going to have to begin the next season with having him fucking come back from Serbia again. Like right. there was that element of it that I felt was like, why would you have to do this to the Sherlock character again? Like, I just thought like the, exiling him at the end of the season again. I just thought the consequences had to be more severe and yeah. more interesting, and they 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 weren't. Uh, like Mycroft should have walked up and then shot Sherlock and then shot Watson and then and then shot himself. Yeah, well then yeah then he goes home and then Lestrade comes in and shoots him like the end of the Departed. Okay, so everyone him. dies. Yeah, except for Lestrade. I'm, now I'm imagining Lestrade in all the like plastic bags yeah, exactly, and stuff like yeah. Mark Wahlberg. No, uh, but yeah, I, I think there's a really good ending scene between Watson and Holmes. That I think it's. I don't think from a writing standpoint it fully pays off on where those characters are at, but it's very well acted. There's an east wind coming. 
Yeah, they say it too much at the end of this episode, don't they? <laughs> I mean, they they like start saying it. I think about like halfway through the episode because I think the first time it gets mentioned is when they're like after it does the weird cut in time, and then yeah, then they keep on mentioning there is yeah. an east wind coming. Do you want to explain to the listeners the origin of that line? Yeah, it's just it's a line that I think is the last line in his last bow, which is not actually the last Sherlock Holmes story, but people it's kind of is in a sense. But yeah, it's he. Says, you know, Watson, I think there's an east wind coming. It's a, it's a whole speech, and they do the whole speech in the episode. But it's basically the line is, like I said earlier, it's it's a portent of World War of World War One because his last bow is a spy story where he's like, it's like, it's all spy shit in like between England and uh, Germany, and so it's it's anticipating the onset of World War One. And then that line was very famously used in a Basil Rathbone film that was. Not an adaptation. It was like just set in World War Two. It was, I think, it was made during World War Two, and so then that line was reused there in context of it being in World War Two. So it's kind of, in a sense, a what like it's one of the more famous Sherlock Holmes quotations that is an actual Sherlock Holmes quotation, unlike Elementary, my dear Watson. Right. So, which is funny that you'd name a show Elementary when it's like not an actual. They, they should have named the show. It's simplicity itself, my dear Watson. I want to say about that elementary show. Yeah. Um, to be fair, people really like that show. Yeah. I've, I've heard never seen it. I've heard really good things about it. There are a lot of people who say their Moriarty was actually really interesting, and they yeah. did it in a really interesting way. And I've honestly heard nothing but pretty good things about it for a while. I'm going to give it a try yeah. because there's an upside to that show, which is that it's an actual serialized television show, mm-hmm. so they could do better long form storytelling. Yeah. <laughs> so in any case, and like they haven't done the as far as I know any dumb stuff with like Holmes and Watson fucking or anything yeah. like that. You know. So. It's good because that was like the immediate thing that seemed right. to be what they would immediately do. Yeah, like you know, giving a female doctor a pink sonic screwdriver. Exactly. It's like the the worst thing you could do. Yeah, they haven't done it anyway. So yeah. So anyway, his last vow. I have some problems with the ending before we get to the cliffhanger. But when we get to the cliffhanger, <laughs> oh my god! I said every swear word I know, and I think I invented some new ones. Yeah. So everyone gets in a cab or something, and then a TV comes on, and, and I, an east wind comes. Right, an east wind comes, and it you know the TV is blacking out, and I know exactly what they're about to do because yeah. it's obvious. Yeah. And I'm hoping they're not going to do it. Yeah. Like I'm hoping it's going to be like Magnuson, like you know, you thought you could kill me, nothing can kill me. Yes. That would have been cool, but no, it's fucking Moriarty being as annoying as ever. Yeah. And and does he say like, did you miss me? Is that what he says like over and over yeah, again? Yeah. Something like that. And then they turn Holmes's plane around, which that makes no fucking sense, but whatever, yeah. and bring him back because they, they should have just like literally like reversed the footage of a plane duck up with like <laughs> like, like a Looney Tunes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like and then he gets out like all fast speed and it's like, did you miss me? <laughs> yeah. I heard so, there was an east wind coming, Watson. I mean, I will be done. With Sherlock, if they, if they are actually me. bringing Moriarty back, I, I really don't think they are. Like I, th- I think it's a, it's, I think they kind of in a way want us to think he is, and kind of in a way are really telling us that no, he's not fucking coming back. Because holy shit, if he comes back, what a colossal mistake that would be in so many ways. I don't even care about the fact that we saw him shoot himself in the head. Yeah, who cares? They, they've, it's, it would be stupid. But anything with Moriarty would be stupid. What it's this is a more creative show than that, and even yeah. if. You know, Sean, even if you didn't like the stories this year, they were still creative this year. Yeah, yeah. Especially with They're the trying character. to do something different. Yeah. yeah. And and whether or not it completely worked for you, this this was still Sherlock, this was still them doing something very, you know, good and interesting this year, and no matter what, I thought they were moving their story and characters forward. Yeah. And this would be such a major regression yeah. into an era the show has gotten past, into a character the show never needed and yeah. did a poor job with. And it's just, it's, it's tone deaf. I mean, I know there are fans of this Moriarty out there, but even if you're a fan, you do you need to see him again? You know, Star know. Trek X didn't bring Khan back. Yeah. You know? I mean, Star Trek Into Darkness did, but... But it was, at least it was a different actor, different set of yeah, characters. Yeah, I mean, it was you know? Sherlock. Yeah. 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 Such but. smog. <laughs> ben Cumberbatch is a good actor. Yeah, he is, but... Yeah, like, you know what? If they brought more, if here's what we've talked about. Yes. That what if like we reveal the actual Moriarty now? Yeah, yeah. That the and, other Moriarty because like they had the whole thing at the end of season two where that dude was like an actor. Yeah. But he wasn't actually an actor. He was actually a Moriarty. Made but no what sense. if he actually was an actor who was hired by the actual Moriarty, or just a, a you know a, 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 a you know henchman? Yeah. But yeah. But here's what I was gonna say. If we meet the actual Moriarty, I want it to be Benedict Cumberbatch in a wig. <laughs> Like a wig and a mustache, just go for Not it. Not even a wig. Like comb his hair differently, like the Enemy of the World, the Doctor Who episode with yes. Patrick Troughton, and he has a Spanish accent now. Yeah, 
to give him the Spanish accent he what was never able to do in Star Trek Into Darkness. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think it'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of calling him Moriarty, just call him Salamander. And Moriarty can have a friend played by Martin Freeman. Yeah, exactly. It can be like a yeah, Martin, Martin Freeman has the fake mustache on again. <laughs> like, it's just the same one. Yes. So it could be like the Star Trek episode where they... One of the many Star Trek yeah, episodes. Yeah, exactly. The, one of the, the two dozen Star Trek episodes where there was a teleporter malfunction or something. And like the antimatter people or the like fifth dimensional people. They're clones of us but are evil or not evil come over. Yeah, those yes. ones. <laughs> I love Star Trek. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so that's annoying. It definitely put a damper on what had been to me a really good season. And to you at to least me, a, like a lukewarm season. series of season. But yeah, but... Just because it was a lukewarm season does not mean I wanted them to bring back the what I thought was the most distasteful aspect of the previous seasons. And it's something like, you know, when we, I was talking earlier about, I find it like really fascinating when you see Sherlock Holmes the da- adaptations about what they focus on. One thing they always focus on too much is fucking Moriarty. Yeah, it's, it's he's always in too one much. story. He's like talked about in a few others. He's got a decent sort of like, I mean, he's dead, but he has a kind of a presence in the empty house, and that's it. And you know, like, that's all he needs to be. He is an interesting character. He's, like, the only, like, really significant, like, villain foil Tomes has. Like, there are other ones, but they're not major. Like, you, there's not a huge point in trying to adapt any other villains, really. But it's, like, you don't need Moriarty. Like, for fuck's sake. Like, they should not have brought... Like, I remember when I was watching the show originally being really disappointed that they had Moriarty in it at the end of the first season at all. And then especially disappointed that they had a shitty version of Moriarty. But people lean on the Moriarty crutch way too much. They should have waited until, like, now, at the very least, to introduce Mor- Moriarty for the first time. But they definitely should not go back to him after they fucking killed him off. Yeah, no, I... They're Moriarty... I, and the whole focus on Moriarty in all the modern Holmes adaptations, it bothers me, and it's... It's a weird thing, though, where, you know, the Holmes stories, even though I think they have interesting characters sprinkled throughout, the recognizable ones are Moriarty and Irene Adler. Yeah. So they always have to do those. Sherlock got lucky and did a fantastic Irene Adler. Yeah. So we don't hold that against them. Mm -hmm. But both of those characters are focused on too much. Yeah. And it's just, and it makes for this cycle of Sherlock stories that are all drawing from a very small pool of material where Arthur Conan Doyle wrote a ton. There's plenty to adapt if you want, you know? And like like doing a version of Milverton as Magnuson, that's so much more creative because that's not a villain you immediately point to and say you have to do that in a Sherlock story. Mm -hmm. So that's so much more creative of them to say, what would this character be now? How can we take this minor, you know, short story character and, and do a story around them? Yeah. That's more interesting than doing Moriarty to me because Moriarty is the obvious choice. Yeah. And honestly, the way they... We haven't even really described why we hate their Moriarty. He's just terrible. He's terrible in every way. But he's also so much the obvious way to reinvent Moriarty, which is yeah. to make him manic and Joker-ish. And even calling him Joker's to me is giving him too much. He's more generic than that. He's yeah. just a... Silly, maniacal villain. They do the Dark Knight thing where he gets arrested, but he, you know, always meant to, and then yeah. he gets out. It's yeah, the ridiculous like yeah. plotting shit. Yeah, and then nothing about him is interesting in the slightest. And on top of that, he is actively annoying. Yeah. And uh, annoying is not a word I use to describe characters much because I think it's one of those words that I think like the word boring that can be yeah. a lazy criticism. He is annoying. He makes you want to leave the room when he's on screen. He is yeah. just obnoxious. Above and beyond what they want him to be, I think. Yeah. And, like, in, you know, like we were talking earlier, Magnuson has this, like, very threatening presence. This, like, fucking Moriarty has no... Like, I feel like if I encountered that Moriarty, I could just beat the shit out of him and yeah. then walk away. And there'd be no consequences for it. I and mean, he would go cry in the fucking corner like the little bitch he is, you know? Like, exactly. He's not... He's just such a... He seems like such a wuss that has no sense of power about him whatsoever. This, like, who fucking gives a shit? Yeah. Watson should have beat this dude to death with a fucking tire iron. Which is how I imagine Watson in my head. That's how the episode actually ended. Is beat you want to see the tire iron. You want to see a good version of I think what they may have been initially trying to go for with Moriarty on this show what? with that effeminate side. Go watch Javier Bardem in Skyfall. Yeah, yeah, that, very much. Yes, that would be an interesting modern Moriarty kind of figure. Yes, because he is terrifying, but he is also he can be kind of silly and a, and he has this kind of gay overtones. I don't know how else to say that. Yeah. Um, where he's kind of using his sexuality to threaten James Bond, who he views as, you know, very overtly heterosexual, which he is. Um, That's a more interesting version of taking, like, a that's like taking a Bond villain and making him 21st century. Yeah. They did not do that well on Sherlock. No, they didn't. (laughs) But, in any case, thumbs up on Series 3 for me. Like, thumbs sideways. Like, I don't hate it. Like, it's just like... 
it didn't satisfy me. But one thing I will say is that since it didn't satisfy that like murder mystery craving I was having, which is very different from my murder cravings that I have every now and then, I started watching on Netflix Columbo, which is that old like detective series from the late seventies into the eighties. And that show is fucking amazing. God, you should go get yourself a retirement home, Sean. What? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Columbo legitimately is probably the best detective in any detective fiction I've ever seen, and I'm only through season two. So, okay. fuck you. <laughs> you Columbo me, is me one of the best it. shows I have ever seen, ever. Don't make jokes about retirement homes. You've never seen are Columbo? Are you going to watch Matlock? Next? You have no fucking clue. Go watch. Do you know who directed the first episode of Columbo? No, I don't. Steven Spielberg. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. So, fuck you. Do you know who is a guest star in an episode of Columbo? Fucking Johnny Cash. So fuck you. Does does Netflix have I Love Lucy and the Golden Girls too? Seriously, Jonathan, you need to watch Columbo. Okay, I it was understand. legitimately one of the best shows I've ever seen. Okay, and actually, like I had no because I knew basically nothing about Columbo. I had heard I was actually watching an episode of uh, QI, which is a British quiz show. The, like quiz show is a terrible way to describe the show, but it's hosted by Stephen Fry, and he said at one point that he was comparing, he was answering one of these questions, and he said like he was making an allusion to. Uh, fucking Sophocles and then Columbo in comparing them and I had never really heard about it because it's this way that in Plato's uh, Plato like writes these stories like where Sophocles is a character and Sophocles makes himself seem like yeah. not Sophocles Socrates I'm sorry he makes himself seem like a sort of a fool in, in the Plato stories and Columbo does the same thing and then Stephen Fry who is an immensely intelligent man says that Columbo is the best TV show he's ever seen, and that if he's taking Columbo and Socrates and putting them next to each other, he legitimately liked Michael Columbo. And I was like, okay, I need to watch it. And you know that format, the format that Sherlock has, which is like these 90 minute long, like long episodes? Columbo does that. Like it has basically six or seven episode long seasons with movie length episodes, with like effectively at the time what would be a movie budget with like movie level actors, with like movie level directors. Like I said, Steven Spielberg directed the first episode. Okay, it now is. I feel really bad for making yeah, fun of Yeah, you me. have no fucking clue I, I, no, I, what you're talking about when I, you're making fun of Columbo. You have no idea you have to watch the show. I, I knew. I, I just want to say I knew nothing about Columbo. Yeah. I just thought it was funny because I didn't expect to hear that show come out of your mouth because it's old. But, but it's... It sounds good. It's awesome. Yeah. It, and it's also, like, it's weirdly really experimental in, like, this awesome 70s way of, like, the direction of the show is fucking fantastic. Like, in one of the episodes, there's this whole sequence... Where the dude commits the murder, and then you see, like, it zooms in on his face and he's wearing these glasses. And then you see in the reflections of his glasses the sequence of him trying to, like, put away, like, like, like clean up the crime scene. It's, like, it's a super interesting way to direct the scene. It's fucking awesome. So, if anyone has not seen Columbo, fucking watch Columbo. The, it's the, most of the show, the first seven seasons, are on Netflix, so. Oh, it's, it, is, it is as old as I thought it was. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. Yeah, Peter Falk as Columbo, fucking amazing. So, okay. fuck you, Jonathan. You have I, no I'm, idea. I'm sorry. You have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. You will go watch, <laughs> like, you will go watch the first episode. The first episode is fucking amazing. And you will listen back to this podcast when you're trying to make fun of me, and you'll want to kill yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. And I realize, you know, I made fun of you while well, we talk about Doctor Who all the time, which is much Yeah, older. Doctor Who was made in fucking 1963. Like, oh, did they put I Love Lucy on Netflix, too? Were you watching Leave It to Beaver, Sean? Fuck you. It's fucking Columbo. All right. It's what? The Columbo won, like, nine fucking Emmys. Like, Peter Falk won a whole bunch of fucking Emmys for his The Big Bang Theory has won Emmys. That's not... Yeah, well, <laughs> this was when it meant something. Okay. You know, it's not today. All right. So anything else to talk about before we sign off here? I just want to watch more Columbo. Okay. Well, next week our All Columbo All the Time podcast. Yeah, you need to watch at least the first episode. Okay. I, I will try. Okay. All right. So we'll see you guys next week. I think, Jonathan, I think there's an east wind coming. <laughs>